morning, everybody. Thanks for joining on this Sunday morning. Uh, we bring you another edition of uh, Ahuja Bajaj Symposium, seventh edition on this Sunday. Uh, this is brought to you by National Diabetes, Obesity and Cholesterol Foundation and Fort Cedoc Hospital for Diabetes and Allied Sciences. Um, now, uh, this symposium is uh, dedicated to two great personalities, uh, Professor MMS Ahuja, Professor of Medicine at All India Institute of Medical Sciences, and he is uh, literally the found uh, made the foundation for diabetes in India and established Research Society of Diabetes in India. He was my teacher, and Dr. J S Bajaj, Padam Shri and Padam Bhushan, a great personality, again my teacher and one who brought for the first time International Diabetes Federation Congress to Delhi in 1977, besides numerous other achievements. Uh, this is my team. Uh, many of them will be speaking here today. Uh, we have a number of national and international collaborators uh, with huge amount of research we have done in last two decades and particularly in last Six years, and you can see the um, citation from NDOC, uh, from Fortis C Doc, and myself from 2014 to 2021. Highest citations: 2024,600. Huge number of citations because of our number of research papers um, regarding COVID-19 and diabetes. And we are probably this year we will surpass this citation also. By this time, we already have 3,500 citations. In addition, uh, uh, you can see that I'm ranking at this point because of my team and because of Fortis Doc and because of NDOC, um, the research generated by the number of people associated with me I'm at this point of time ranking as a two percent of Indian scientists as far as diabetes is concerned. This has been published recently in PLOS One, PLOS Biology. In addition, uh, uh, the journal Di um, Diabetes and Metabolic Syndrome Clinical Research and Reviews, uh, which is a partly sponsored by uh, NDOC and partly by Diabetes India, uh, in 2020 and up to May 2021, it is ranked very, very high. So you can see Lance, after Lancet is having, uh, ranking uh, number two uh, and ahead of JAMA, New England Journal of Medicine uh, and other eminent journals. So we have achieved a lot in the last one and a half years by our research and our publication. And uh, uh, it is thanks to my team and my workers who have contributed relentlessly to achieve this. And finally, um, those of you who are interested, please write to Koel Datta for uh, getting the free copy of my book. Uh, it is the revised edition of Diabetes and Delight with seven new chapters. Uh, so with that, I welcome you once again to this very exciting symposium. Um, we are specifically targeting the recent concept in diabetes. Each topic is going to be spoken in a very crisp and short manner. By 10 to 12 minutes, each speaker will finish the topic, leaving around two minutes for questions. So we'll be very short, yet we'll be able to communicate to you everything which is relevant in this topic. All our new topics, most are in nutrition, diabetes, obesity, and drugs. So I hope you enjoy this uh, short symposium and yet full of new knowledge on this Sunday morning. Thank you again for coming. And at this time, I invite Dr. G.S. Kohli, a senior consultant in diabetes and medicine and, and, and a very well-respected physician uh, he will be speaking on evidence to experience choosing the right DPP-4 inhibitor. Thank you, Dr. Kohli, for joining us. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Dr. Anub Mishra, for including me in your program. I will just start the presentation. Can you see the slides, please? 
Yeah, if you can expand this slide. Yeah. So the topic assigned to me today is choosing the right DPP4 inhibitors. What is the evidence? We all are familiar with the use of DPP4 inhibitors and have been using it for a long time now. But the dilemma often is which one to choose, which is the best. All are equally efficient in reducing the HbA1c level, but choosing among them is a problem. So let me see what is the evidence for and against any DPP4 inhibitors. Yes. In spite of so many drugs available for the control of diabetes, the figures stand at a dismal 24% of the diabetes actually reach the HbA1c level of less than 7. So, where lies the problem? So, we are having a problem in the long-term durable glycemic control in our diabetic patients. And the basic cause attributed to this decline is because of the progressive nature of the disease when there is a progressive decline in the beta cell function over a period of time, which leads to, again, a defective glycemic control. And also, the therapy we have been using, like sulfonylurea and metformin alone are in combination. There they have, they exhaust the beta cells and slowly the beta cell function declines and these patients again develop uncontrolled diabetes. So, how to counteract this? To counteract this, the need of our is to devise a therapy which can spare these beta cells, or rather protect and cause the recovery of these beta cell functions, thereby leading to long-term glycemic control. And I think DPP-4 inhibitors is one of those drugs which can do that. So we all are familiar with the mode of action of DPP-4 inhibitors. It acts on DPP, it causes inhibition of the DPP-4 enzyme, thereby reducing glycemia, sustain insulin levels, reduces the glucagon level, and preserve beta cell mass and decrease the beta cell apoptosis. So it has got a beta cell sparing action because it acts basically by incretin mechanism. So it has the potentiality of having a long-term glycemic control of diabetes. Now, here are some of the advantages which are attributed to DPV-4 inhibitors, and they have been enumerated in the Diabetes Care Standard of Medical Care Di in Diabetes 2020. They are all efficient, we know that, and there is a minimal risk of hypoglycemia with them. They are weight neutral, they are well tolerated and there is no significant drug interaction and they are cardiovascular safe which is a very important point and we have just seen because their action is because of their action of sparing the beta cells they have got durable uh, glycemic control in diabetic patients apart from that another point is it also decreases the glycemic variability, intraday and intraday glycemic variability is also addressed to by these DPP-4 inhibitors. Now, the question we are trying to find out, which DPP-4 inhibitor will be the right choice as an add-on drug to the metformin and other drugs? So when we decide on the choice of DPP-4 inhibitors, we have to consider these four points. How much percentage inhibition of plasma DP4 activity it can do? How efficient is your drug? And can it address the glycemic variability? And of course, safety as far as hypoglycemia, weight gain, and cardiovascular safety is concerned. So let's take the first point, that is the percentage inhibition of plasma DP4 inhibitors. So here is a comparison of the four common gliptins used in our practice, Wilda, Sita, Lina, and Tenali gliptin. So if you see here, percentage inhibition of DPP4 activity over 24 hours was seen maximum with 97%, followed by Sita, Lina, and you can see all them 
so it has the maximum inhibition of plasma dpp4 activity normally for a dpp4 inhibitors to have a good therapeutic efficacy it needs to have at least 80% or more dpp4 inhibition and i think all the top 3 fulfill that criteria the only limitation here if you can see viltagliptin has to be given here which is done twice a day 50 mg bd while rest of the drugs can be given in once a dose but now with the advent of the new once a day viltagliptin 100 mg i think this problem has also been solved and it has been proved that even the new viltagliptin in once a day dose can do uh, cause inhibition up to the tune of 84 to 87% so another positive point with viltagliptin as compared to the other gliptin is that even after dilution that is even after the blood level of viltag drug is coming down it still causes significant dpp4 inhibition while the other drugs after some time when the the drug level falls in the blood the inhibition decreases now coming to the efficacy once there is a dpp4 inhibitions in significant way the effect of this is of course more efficacy so if we compare the efficacy of viltagliptin with the other two gliptins like sertagliptin and sertagliptin and if we keep the target below 6.5 you see here the 36% of the patients reach the target with viltagliptin while it was much less 25% with seta and 32% with sertagliptin but if we keep the target like we do in india that is less than 7% as per ad american association of diabetes guidelines the viltagliptin causes 65% patients to achieve the target while the target achieved with sertagliptin and sertagliptin is 59% of the patients so clearly if you keep even if you keep the target as below 7 or below 6.5 viltagliptin scores over other as far as efficacy is concerned and similarly the reduction in the fasting glucose level is seen maximum with viltagliptin it is up to the tune of around 22 mg percent while with sertagliptin it is around 15% 14.5% to be precise so there is a more reduction in the fasting glucose there is more people reach the hbmc target with viltagliptin now the another issue which is very important is the capability of a dpp4 inhibitor to address to glycemic variability because we all know glycemic variability is very important to prevent various cardiovascular complications and the measure of this glycemic ability is usually mage mean amplitude of glycemic excursion so this is most commonly used measure for evaluating the glycemic variability if you see here the comparison of the glycemic variability or mage response with wilda versus sertagliptin we found the response is much better with viltagliptin so they are more likely to address to this problem of the glycemic variability So we have got lower glycemic variability with viltagliptin compared to sertagliptin and the last and very important point is safety so we have to take three main safe points that is the risk of hypoglycemia weight gain and cardiovascular safety if we see the incidence of hypoglycemia hypoglycemia is less with almost all the dpp4 inhibitors if we see numerically here comparison between viltagliptin and the other gliptins it was least with the viltagliptin around 2% and sertagliptin is not far off it is 3% and sertagliptin it was 6% so viltagliptin is also safe as far as the incidence of hypoglycemia is concerned again all gliptins are weight neutral but again this diagram shows that viltagliptin 100 mg daily as the highest probability in reducing the body weight compared to other gliptins now coming the cardiovascular safety of various gliptins so this is a real world evidence 
of over 239,000 patients and they compared the incidence of high heart failure with these three drugs, Ceta, Sexa and Vildagliptine and it was found that the lowest incidence of heart failure was seen with Vildagliptine up to the tune of 1.91 as compared to 2.77 with Cetagliptin. So risk of hospitalization because of heart failure is also much less in this study. So it has the lower risk of heart failure compared to other gliptins. Now this is another retrospective study involving about 17,615 patients and what they saw, the incidence rate of first hospitalization for heart failure was also least with vidragliptin as compared to CETA and SEXA. And there was a 33% lower risk of hospitalization for heart failure compared to other gliptins. Dr. Kohli, you have uh, one minute. Okay. Yeah. So similarly, effect on left ventricular ejection fraction was also positive. There was no change in the ejection fraction when this drug was used. So these are the uh, another six studies which all showed that it is a cardiovascular safe drugs. This is just a comparison of these three drugs, Theta, Vilda, and Lina, and it has shown that it excels in all the fields as far as efficacy, glycemic variability, hospitalization for heart failure, and long-term durability. So it is a preferred drug because it possesses the following properties. It has the maximum inhibition of the plasma DP4 activity. It can more patients achieve HbA1c target. It can reduce fasting glucose level. It addresses glycemic variability and it is safe. So take home message is when we are treating diabetes, we should choose therapies which show intensive long-term glycemic control with protection and recovery of the beta cells. And DPP4 inhibitors are one of such drugs. And if out of them, if the data suggests the vildagliptin is a good choice of DP4 inhibitors to be used in these patients. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kohli, for that very crisp, very clear message regarding vildagliptin. Uh, could you please unshare your slide, please? So thank you. Uh, I think uh, we are in, running a little bit late as far as program is concerned. So Dr. Kohli, be with us uh, and we can ask you a question if time permits later on. We move ahead uh, uh, with the sec second lecture and that is from my very dear friend, uh, Dr. Sujit Jha, who is Director of Endocrinology, Diabetes and Metabolism, Max Healthcare, and who's been an avid researcher in various aspects of diabetes, including genetics of uh, diabetes, where he has just finished um, uh, a major project uh, sponsored by uh, Indian agencies as well as uh, international agencies. So Sujit, welcome uh, to the symposium. And thanks for joining in. You have 12 minutes, Sujit. Sujit? Yeah. Uh, I'm sure you can hear me. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, good morning, Professor Mishra. You know, good to be, you know, hearing and good to the science talking in this country, sir. And I, I mean it, you know. The science must talk and science must prevail. And sometimes I feel science doesn't prevail in this country. And I think somebody like you who's leading that, and I'm very proud of you, sir. And I also add that that 2% of the scientific community, uh, my father also belongs to in that infectious disease, uh, plus one uh, data set as well. So uh, this topic, you know, sim 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 looks simple, but I must say that I must uh, have spent 20, 40 hours on to do that, what to talk about. And uh, uh, this is, uh, uh, you know, it's not easy for us to talk about beta cell preservation because I don't know why it's not moving. Yeah. So as you know, uh, you know, the beta cell fails by 50 to 80% by the time you get diabetes, impaired glucose tolerance starts process quite early. So the beta cell preservation need to start early. You know, a lot of patients comes to us now, what should we do? You have type 2 diabetes, 50% to 80% pancreas gone, means functioning gone, the beta cell preservation should start when the beta cell starts decaying early in part of life when the insulin resistance happens. But unfortunately, we as a clinicians or the patient tends to come to us for very late beta cell preservations or if we think about beta cell preservations. We in our clinical practice, we don't think about it because we don't have opportunity of window of opportunity to get into beta cell preservation. It's a complex slide, pathophysiology of type 1 diabetes. This is again, 
why I have to pick up beta cell preservation because this is one wonderful Lancet Endo article came this week on uh, on type one uh, uh, delaying of little of insulin for a couple of years time by immunotherapy as well. So how can we do an effect and at what level of antigen uh, immune reaction we can prevent beta cell preservation so that uh, kids don't develop type one diabetes. Type two diabetes is a complex pathophysiology. One of these little less known is the beta cell fat mass. Why it's so important, and I'll come back to in a couple of slides later, that beta cell, I'm just trying to highlight, you know, what we talk about octate, there are 11 to 12 path pathophysiology, which tends to work, which includes microbiota as well, and a beta cell, is, a beta cell fat mass besides 9, 10, we all know about it. So initially, it is used to talk more about um, insulin resistance, but now it has become a more beta cell centric pathophysiology. That's why the beta cell, beta cell preservation becomes more important. And how would we, uh, in day-to-day -day clinical practice or primordial or primary preventions in the community, that we can preserve beta cell so that patients don't become diabetes? So I'm not going to the beta cell regeneration, but beta cell preservation for diabetes treatment. You know, there are multiple complex therapy, but I thought, you know, uh, let's go into what really happens, the mechanism of beta cell uh, toxicity, which is glucotoxicity, which is traditional old most professor, you know, who will say that you, most, most patients would come at the late presentations um, with the blood sugars of 400 and 500 and glucotoxicity. And I call it uh, in the pancreas, Kim Kirtav Mool Ho Gaya. You know, it's become so static that pancreas doesn't know what to do about it. Lipotoxicity, all this, uh, you know, inflammatory process, which makes beta cell damage um, uh, progressive. Now, I thought what the clinician should think about and what clinicians should do about this, you know, there's no doubt about it. The biggest evidence so far is the dietary evidence followed by pharmacological insulin bariatrics and the new advances in type 1 diabetes. So I'm just going to focus on these four, four, five topics. You know, we Indians have got more risk of diabetes. That's one of the things that we have been associated with the uh, international group and trying to understand the reason behind this. And some of it, our publications in um, Nature about the epigenetics in type 2 diabetes. And we have created a large biobank and trying to produce some more data, which, as you know, it's a very slow process to get into uh, the, the regulatory process that what we have in the country to get some international consortium data into the one platform. But we're trying to understand that how do we do diabetes prevention and must say that, you know, the, the, the beta cell preservation should start here, not here. That's what I'm trying to say. And, uh, and the three prevention studies, the three and major prevention studies have clearly shows that dietary interventions can delay the progression of beta cell preservation, um, uh, deterioration. So we also contributed, and this is under publications into one of the highest impact journal, the eye health study, which we had recruited 3,600 across the South Asian continent we contributed 900 patients for this, and we have sent the publications under the consideration into one of the high impact journals where we showed 1.8 kilogram weight loss and a waist size significant as well. It's tough to do lifestyle intervention study in any part of the world, including this country, because the free advice, the dietary advice, sustained advice, continued advice, uh, participants don't tend to follow. But yes, we could fill a large follow up. And we could see uh, it is an unpub unpublished data, but we had a good in, uh, good uh, outcomes and it will be hopefully will be there in the press in a uh, couple of weeks time. So uh, this we know as well, you know, and uh, Nita Paroki with Prof Mishra, it is a very good article. Everybody must read this article. BMJ came a couple of years ago is about, you know, the, the whole progressions of general population. We're trying to prevent the beta cell at this point rather than with, at this point. And, and, and they have discussed about different dietary factors. So some of it has been taken from there that, that it is true that certain dietary methods uh, can provoke beta cell deteriorations compared to whole grains, fruits, fermented, uh, fermented uh, products uh, and coffee and tea and uh, can prevent progression of diabetes indirectly preserving beta cell. So we also did call it reversal study. Why I'm talking reversal study? Because to understand that
Sujit, your um, microphone is stuck. Uh, your video is also stuck. Patients, we could do uh, and forty percent patient. Can you hear me? Can you hear me, sir? Can you hear me? Hello, can you hear me? No. Yeah, we can hear you. Please yes, sir, continue. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, I'm just moving near the Wi Fi. So right. I just want to show one thing that the beta cell tends to improve in patients after reversal. It has been shown in MRI fat studies that beta cell fat tends to come down, which improves the beta cell and directly improving the beta cell preservation. And, 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 and the therapies around the beta cell functions are several therapies which can improve the beta cell functions, but I'm not going to details of this, mainly because I'm just coming back to the drugs. There's no doubt that glitazones has the, the best evidence so far to improve the beta cell function when it comes to oral drug therapy. Metformin did show long-term studies did show some slow decline in process in first phase insulin, insulin reactions. Sulfur and urea on a long term has not shown any preventions of beta cell preservation. In fact, it's other way around. Some studies have shown sulfur and urea tends to uh, decay the, uh, uh, the early decay of beta cell. Uh, uh, of beta cell. GLP receptors also, the LIRA study, there is one of the studies have shown that, uh, uh, that uh, it has, it can, slow the process, improve the beta cell secretory capacity, particularly first phase again, and improve the capacity of beta cells to sense and respond to glucose. You know, there is an alpha beta cell mechanism which tends to improve by giving the GLP receptors agonism, uh, agonist therapy can also improve the beta cell preservations. And now the DPP-4 vildagliptin, as Dr. Colley was talking about, there's also some evidence that vildagliptin or any gliptin can also improve the beta cell secretory capacity over the period of one year treatment. And uh, uh, I'll not go there. I'll just come back to my favorite topic. I personally feel as a clinician where you can really make a dent and preserve beta cell is by giving insulin therapy in a patient with a new big bang diabetes. And there are a large number of studies coming from China coming from other Southeast countries, including Professor Mohan as well, which has clearly shown that if you initiate insulin, any form of insulin therapy in a new onset diabetes, even for four to 12 weeks time, you improve the two years outcome, beta cell, C-peptides and HOMA levels tends to improve. So as you can see, you know, you know uh, uh, as you can see clearly that after therapy, I'm not going to go in details of it, but definitely that insulin therapy tends to have improved the beta cell function in patients with type 2 diabetes with an early onset diabetes. And this is same similar data come from Mohan as well, uh, Mohan group as well, which has clearly shown that long-term glycemic control with preserving beta cell function in your clinical practice is by initiating insulin particularly multiple dose therapy or even one short, one long acting insulin can improve the beta cell preservation as well. And interestingly, this is our, you know, my favorite case, flat push diabetes. You know, what happens in, you know, we say that, you know, the pancreatic function goes 50%. So just just have one minute, please. Okay, so I'll just go there. So bariatric surgery, we all know, yes, right from day one, patient insulin resistance improve by bariatric surgery. And neoinsulin type 2 diabetes, one line about imatinib, uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitors tends to improve the insulin reductions over the period of 12 months period. You must go through this article. This is a very promising first time extensive data over the period of two years time has been published last week. Very limited side effect, but very interesting molecule for preservation of beta cell in type 1. So again, this is the data which is shown that how the, you know, uh, the insulin tends to improve. So in conclusion, you know, uh, the low calorie diet, early insulin treatment uh, can be initiated to improve the beta cell function. And obviously the bariatric surgery can also improve the beta cell preservation therapy. Aggressive insulin therapy is important. 
And I tell my patients in early big bang diabetes who are presenting with high sugars, even if ketones negative, that insulin is the only treatment which can take you off insulin. And insulin is the only treatment which can temporarily take off the diabetes off your list of diagnoses. So yes, all the treatment, you know, when you design the uh, therapy of the treatment, uh, one of the most clinically significant you can do in, in new onset diabetes, initiate insulin treatment, DPP-4, GLP receptor agonists is part of the therapy. But if you want to preserve beta cell in a new onset diabetes, Feel insulin has the best. So Over to you, Pastor. Yeah. We are losing you. Uh, okay, if you can unshare a slide, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sujit, for uh, you know telling us about a very very difficult subject in a very simple manner. Uh, Sujit, are you there? Yeah, yeah, I'm there. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, Sujit, I have one question which combines the previous two lectures, and that is, uh, uh, what do you think about, uh, you know, amongst all the gliptins, uh, Bilda Glyptin, uh, you showed one slide, uh, how, is, is, is there a difference in uh, beta cell preservation capacity between uh, the gliptins, is there a Bilda Glyptin better, or, or it's the same, what is your opinion about it? Sujit? Similar. I think some have more data, but will, yeah. I don't know why. I'm, I'm just near my wife. I, I'm looking into data of different gliptins, and uh, but definitely the Wilder gliptin has clearly shown the beta cell preservation, but that doesn't mean that tech is not doing it. But Wilder gliptin has clearly has shown on the data outcomes in the basic scientific data and clinical uh, clinical based evidence because uh, the trial which has delayed the second line, second therapy in Vildaglip therapy has clearly shown that it all has beta cell preservation. Thank you. Thank you, Sujit, for the wonderful presentation. We move on to a very, very important uh, lecture on uh, new vistas in incretin therapy. Absolutely brand new topic, oral semaglutide and twin incretins. Dr. Ritesh Gupta, who is additional director at Photo CDOC, and he's a specialist in uh, uh, endo... Um, androgens, testosterone therapy, and diabetes, and insulin pump. So, Ritesh. Yes, sir. Uh, my uh, topic is new vistas in incretin therapy, and I'll be talking about oral semaglutide and what is called twin cretin. So, somewhat uh, new concept. Uh, so, we'll start with oral semaglutide. Now, semaglutide or any GLP-1, as you know, is a peptide just like insulin and parathyroid hormone or somatostatin or growth hormone, etc. And, and we know that all of these are injectable because there are significant barriers to oral delivery of peptide-based drugs. So Dr. Jha was talking about the holy grail for diabetes prevention, but then for beta cell preservation at the same time, we, have, uh, uh, we are faced with a holy grail for oral delivery of insulin and we haven't yet found it. But maybe we have found something now. Uh, there are barriers. There is acid and proteolytic enzyme, uh, 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 enzymes in the stomach, which pose a barrier to oral delivery of peptide-based drugs. And also, uh, peptides and proteins have limited permeability through the GI epithelium. And that is why it is very difficult to design a drug, a peptide, which can be given orally. Uh, this has been circumvented by science and, and what is called peptide in a pill. And semaglutide is just like any other GLP-1 analog. It has a 94% homology to human GLP-1, and it has a plasma half-life of 1B. And that is achieved by these amino acid substitutions. There is a, there is a C18 fatty diacid chain, which provides strong affinity binding to albumin, which prolongs the half-life. And then there is an amino acid substitution called AIB or amino isobutyric acid, which makes it resistant to DPP-4 degradation. Uh, this is what semaglutide is. And semaglutide, as we know, has been used, though it is not available in India, but it is approved. And, and uh, it is, it is uh, being used. It has uh, enough evidence, clinical evidence, uh, for it to be approved. Now, uh, what has been done 
is that it has been combined with what is called SNAC, the sodium and amino caprylate. Now, this is a fatty acid derivative, which is an absorption enhancer. And it increases the bioavailability of semaglutide when it is administered orally. So what one gets as oral semaglutide is a co-formulation of this semaglutide with an absorption enhancer, SNAC. So how it works is that as the tablet goes into the stomach and the tablet erodes, this snack causes a transient localized increase in pH. And that protects the semaglutide molecule from proteolytic degradation in the stomach. And thereafter, it facilitates a highly localized absorption of semaglutide. So the absorption occurs actually very close to the tablet. And that occurs across the gastric mucosa via transcellular pathways. The drug goes inside the cell and then it goes out into the bloodstream. So, so this, is, this is what uh, has been done to achieve bioavailability of uh, semaglutide orally. And semaglutide has been studied well. It has been, it has, uh, uh, been used, so we'll come to that evidence. But certain precautions which you need to take, uh, because it is available in, in, uh, outside and very soon it will be available in India also, so the patient has to take the tablet fasting with a sip of water, and they say about half a glass of water, about 120 ml of water, and should not eat anything for 30 minutes, and should not be taking any other oral medication for at least 30 minutes after taking the tablet. And the dose, starting dose is about 3 mg, which is to be continued daily for one month, and then increased to 7 mg daily for one month. And thereafter, it can be increased to 14 milligram if needed to improve glycemic control. And there's no dose adjustment required in patients with renal or hepatic impairment. But what about drug interactions? Well, it has been studied uh, with various drugs who, uh, being co-administered. And as one can see, there is some effect. There is increased exposure of most drugs uh, primarily by, by uh, delaying gastric empty. And if you see metformin and rosuvastatin, uh, the, the area under the curve goes up significantly. But it has been seen that this is not clinically significant. So metformin, by availability or exposure, goes up by about 30%. But metformin being a drug with, with a high therapeutic window, it does not really translate into any clinically meaning, meaningful uh, uh, changes. And similarly with rosuvastatin, it is, it, is, it is well within the safe limits. So no dose adjustment is required when oral semaglutide is being administered. Efficacy, semaglutide has, uh, has had uh, uh, extensive efficacy and safety program. Uh, there are a number of trials. There was sustained program, sustained one, two, three, four, five, and six, uh, which, uh, which evaluated subcutaneous uh, semaglutide. And then there was pioneer program, uh, which evaluated oral semaglutide. And as you can see, uh, the, the efficacy is comparable uh, with whether it is oral or subcutaneous semaglutide. After all, it is the same drug. So whether it is monotherapy or it is combined with other drugs like cetagliptin or with, with even with duraglutide or liraglutide, uh, the, the efficacy remains comparable. Now, if you see the effect on body weight, the effect on body weight is also as expected with any other uh, um, gliptin. Uh, it, it leads to significant weight loss in, in as monotherapy or as when combined with other agents. So, in nutshell, it's a it's a, uh, it's a it's a promising drug. And but what we need is is a cardiovascular outcome trial, and that that is what we have also now. And this is called Pioneer yes. Six, uh, which was a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial, even given. <laughs> And patients at high cardiovascular risk, and this was defined as 50 years or more age with established cardiovascular or chronic kidney disease, or 60 years or more age with CV risk factors only. And the primary outcome was first occurrence of a major adverse primary uh, uh, cardiovascular event, death from cardiovascular causes, non-fatal MI or non-fatal stroke. Uh, there were more than 3,000 patients, mean age was 66 years, but the mean follow-up was rather short. It's about 16 months. And this is what the primary composite endpoint was. The hazard ratio was 0.79, which met the criteria for non-inferiority, but did not meet the criteria for superiority. 
So oral semaglutide was not inferior to placebo, but not superior to placebo, which meant it was cardiovascular safe. This was in, uh, and this, this uh, along with it, there was an interesting observation that the cardiovascular mortality uh, went down. Uh, the hazard ratio was 0.49, though it was not explained, and it has been uh, criticized later that the number of events was rather small, the follow up was rather small. So, for me, that is why uh, statistical significance was not reached. This was in contrast to what was found in sustained six with subcutaneous semaglutide. So this was about oral semaglutide. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's the same group of drugs, same same molecule. It is just uh, packaged orally, and it is very exciting because that that would mean that many many more patients could have the the advantage of this wonderful class of drugs. Now, when we talk of incretins, we have we have practically made it synonymous with GLP-1. And we have forgotten about the other incretin, which is GIP. In fact, most of us probably would have forgotten the, the full form of GIP also. It is glucose-dependent insulinotropic polypeptide. It was formerly called gastric inhibitory polypeptide. Now, as opposed to the L cells, which secrete GLP-1, this is secreted by what are called K cells in duodenum and proximal jejunum. Now, it is also secreted in response to oral carbohydrates and lipids, and it is also inactivated by DPP4. And it also has a short half uh, plasma half life, just like GLP1. And there is some, some data that it actually might be contributing more to the incretin effect than GLP1 in normal individuals, but not so in diabetic individuals. And it has some common effects with GLP-1, but not all effects are the same. So, so primarily, if, if we see that there, it, it does reduce food intake by acting on hypothalamus, but it does not reduce the gastric empty. And it has some effects, some effects on bone. It increases bone formation, it reduces bone resorption. And so that could be uh, beneficial uh, in, in elderly. But what is very important is that its effects on, on, on pancreas. It increases insulin secretion in a glucose dependent manner as any incretin is supposed to do. But what it does to, to glucagon is interesting. Now we know that GLP-1, it reduces glucagon during hypo, hyperglycemia, but during hypoglycemia, GLP-1 does not have much effect on glucagon. Now GIP also reduces glucagon during hyperglycemia, but during hypoglycemia, it increases glucagon, and there is that is how it differs from from GI, GLP one, uh, and and this this could also be responsible for many effects which which have been observed in experimental animals and in and in studies uh, which are different from GLP one. But why was it forgotten? If it was promising, then why why did we not talk about it earlier? because it was seen that acute effects of GIP administration on insulin secretion were diminished in type 2 diabetes. So the contribution of GIP to incretin effect in diabetics was supposed to be less. And this was primarily because of receptor desensitization. And, 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 and uh, that is uh, why it was not so important. And also there was some evidence that loss of GIP secretion in experimental animals either genetically modified or pharmacological was leading to weight loss. So the loss of GIP secretion was promoting weight loss. So it was not supposed to be, it was not considered worthy enough to for further investigation that it is, of course, if a drug is causing weight gain, then it is not something which we want to develop. But then it staged a comeback. And why did it stage a comeback is it was observed that if you improve glucose control with other anti-diabetic therapies, that restores the insulin tropic effect of GIP in type 2 diabetes. And also, it was found that chronic activation as opposed to acute activation of GIP receptor, it caused weight loss in mice with high fat induced, high, high fat diet induced obesity. So physiological levels of GIP increased fat accretion in adipocytes. But the pharmacological levels, they re reduce food intake, probably because of CNS effect. Ditesh, you have 
Two minutes, please. Right, sir. So the GLP-1, GIP dual agonism was first described by Finan et al., who developed a unimolecular dual agonist of GLP, GIP and GLP-1 receptors, referred to as a twin curtain. And, and this, uh, in experimental animals, it, it, was, it, was, uh, it was shown to be beneficial in terms of reduction in food intake and glucose and body weight. And, and the simultaneous uh, agonism of GLP-1 and GIP was supposed to enable superior glucose lowering action because they appear to activate distinct subsets of hypothalamic neurons, which leads to reduction in food intake. Now, to, uh, so, so the drug which has been studied is dirzepatide, which is, which is again a GIP molecule, which has been modified to, to make it resistant to DPT-4 and, and uh, 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 to increase its half-life. And if you see, uh, it, it, is, it is almost equally uh, active at GIP receptor as the native GIP. But as far as GLP-1 receptor is concerned, it is less potent and agonist of uh, GLP-1 uh, receptor. And this is the trial which, has, which is available, a surpass two trial in which tirzepatide was compared with semaglutide. With, with tirzepatide, different doses of tirzepatide were compared with semaglutide for, for, uh, for efficacy for glycemic lowering. And this is what was found that, that uh, it, it lowered HPA1C over and above semaglutide uh, so there was there was significant difference between the highest dose of uh, tirzepatide and semaglutide. In fact, between any dose of tirzepatide and semaglutide, and the percent of patients achieving the target HbA1c was much more in in patients who who were on tirzepatide compared to those who were on uh, semaglutide. Uh, change in weight from from baseline that it led like to further weight loss. This was very significant. It led like to further weight loss. And what is important is that, that about 80% of patients achieved 5% weight loss or more, and about 36% patients achieved uh, more than 15% weight loss, which is highly significant. And, and there were some beneficial effects on triglycerides, so it lowered triglycerides, and it based HDL over and above uh, what was done by semaglutide and, and the effect on other lipid parameters was compatible. Adverse events were comparable. Uh, they were primarily GI. There was some increased nausea and vomiting with tirzepatide compared to semaglutide, but overall the adverse effects were not very different. So uh, there was uh, more than eighty percent percent patients achieved HPA1C of less than seven percent, and importantly, forty-seven percent patients achieved an HPA1C of less than five point seven percent without an increased risk of hypoglycemia. This is very significant. And, and 80% patients achieved more than 5% weight loss, 36% achieved more than 15% weight loss. Adverse effects were comparable. And then there are ongoing trials. Uh, the cardiovascular outcome trial, the trial in NASH, the trial in obesity without diabetes, and uh, the trial comparing the tirzepatide with tirzepatide. So there are all kinds of uh, uh, the trials which are going on. But then there are unanswered questions. Do these drugs target GLP-1 and GLP receptors on the same cell, different cells? In different tissues or both. And as uh, the effect of GIP on beta cells, it is susceptible to tachyphylaxis reflecting receptor desensitization. Will this be overcome in, in a single molecule, which is an agonist of both? And will they retain their efficacy and benefits with sustained use? We do not know. And regarding the cardiovascular effects, the, the issue is far from settled. Uh, it has been seen that genetic disruption of GIP receptors in cardiomyocytes is associated with reduced impact size and improved survival in mice. Uh, but on the other hand, the higher GIP levels associated with an increased risk of cardiovascular disease and all-cause mortality. This was an observational study. And higher GIP levels were also seen in subjects with peripheral artery disease. At the same time, adenoviral GIP expression exerted anti-inflammatory actions and reduced atherosclerosis. So, there is insufficient data to predict the outcomes of modifying the GIP receptor signaling. We need to have the trial of, uh, we need to have the cardiovascular uh, outcome trial, which is the surmount trial, which is expected in another two or three years, and where we have these answers. So what is the future? This is my last slide. Uh, the future is polypeptide agonists, an agonist which could act at various uh, peptides, after all, there are so many peptides in the GI tract and hypothalamus which act which act to regulate the diet sugars and, and metabolism and weight. GLP-1 and GIP and glucagon is an important molecule, polycystokine and peptide by by and so many others. And, and just to give an example, the intestinal L cells 
which which uh, uh, they 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 have this pro glucagon gene which is responsible for production of glp1 glucagon and oxytocin plus they secrete cholecystokinin plus they secrete peptide by by so so in a in a normal person the, these are the, th- the, the 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 co-regulation of these and the co-secretion of these molecules is what is important and an and a molecule which could act on multiple peptides is 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 going to be uh, uh, interesting i won't say promising but interesting uh, because we'll need to see the adverse effects also the relative agonism at various uh, peptide receptors is going to be of interest so with that i i uh, finish uh, thank you sir thank you uh, dr ritesh uh, please unshare your slide um, uh, that was uh, actually a two lectures in one it's a very wide topic and emerging topic of a topic of great importance thank you ritesh for Uh, very very clearly stating all the issues including the future issues there is one question from dr atul luthra and i will answer that question and that is uh, with the uh, uh, gastric emptying problem uh, no, it's not a problem it's a effect uh, of uh, uh, the semaglutide uh, what would happen to uh, dose of thyroxin and uh, ppi and so on i can tell you about thyroxin there is a increase area under the curve of thyroxin um uh, with the, this uh, drug so you have to be careful you may have to delink the timing of the two drugs uh, and also uh, there is a, some uh, increase in the area under the curve for furosemide also so thanks uh, atul for answering uh, for asking that very important question we move on to another very very important topic and that is uh, a once weekly basal insulin virtually a uh, uh, a short stopper uh, Uh, it, it will be a blockbuster absolutely so something which uh, people ha- always ask always patients ask uh, 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 can i take something which is once weekly insulin is something is, which is a, a major stumbling block for our treatment so uh, dr amrita ghosh will be speaking on this and dr amrita ghosh is consultant for the cedo hospital uh, and she is a specialist in uh, uh, polycystic ovarian disease and insulin pump amrita thank you and i'll be speaking on once weekly basal insulin and what are the recent insights so moving on you know all these faces and it is etched in our memory here so dr frederick banting who was orthopedic surgeon found out insulin in 1923 and it was first injected to this dog called marjory and the dog survived for 70 days with that help of insulin and with the help of dr john mcloyd a, a purified form of insulin was given to the child of 14 years of age who was just weighing only 15 pounds john thompson leonard thompson and you can see this guy little guy here and this person went on to living 13 years more with the disease and at that time type 1 diabetes was a death sentence so there has been a 100 years of innovation and evolution with the insulin and we have seen a lot of changes coming in the molecule and the and the changes are still continuing the evolution is still continuing and in the past 20 decades we have been sorry in the past two decades we have been seeing a lot of changes in the basal front basal insulin from glargin detemir degludeg uh, glargin u2 u300 which is available and the latest one is once weekly basal insulin icodec and bif so why there has been a quest for a better better basal insulin so the once daily basal which we have right now there is a persistence and adherence issue with the daily injection with once weekly we might have less injection and may increase persistent and adherence hypoglycemia is an issue and glycemic variability comes along with that so this can be decreased with the help of uh, decreasing glycemic variability with a longer duration and need for daily injection may delay initiation you have been seeing patients in your opd in and out who are so reluctant for insulin injection daily but when you might give them an option of weekly insulin the acceptance will be more initiation will be more so talking about the once weekly basal insulin which are in development i'll be focusing on particularly two molecules first one is an fc fusion which is basal insulin at fc called as bif this is a long acting immunoglobin fc fusion protein and the second one is an acylated one called as icodec uh, 
So as Dr. Ritesh has also spoken about the longer duration of action of the molecule. So basically what has happened in this molecule here, Icodec, is there is a addition of C20 fatty diacid to the molecule, which increases the uh, it, which increases the binding to the albumin. This is a strong and a reversible binding. This eventually helps to slow receptor mediated clearance. And the third and the second point is here. There's an addition. There's a substitution of three amino acids, and this uh, basically reduces the insulin receptor affinity. So when this affinity is reduced, so that means there's a reduced enzymatic degradation and slower receptor mediated clearance. This molecule does not demonstrate increased binding to IGF receptor and has low mitogenic potency, which is very good. The time to max concentration is 16 hour and the half-life is 196 hour, which is approximately one week. So moving on to the phase two trial, there have been a lot of phase one study PKPD data is available. So in the basically in phase two trial, this molecule Icodec was compared with another basal insulin glargen. In this, this was a randomized double blind, double dummy phase two trial. So the study design was basically, there were two arms. One arm had Icodec weekly, metformin, plus or minus DPP-4, plus a daily placebo basal, kind of uh, uh, daily placebo. And the second arm had insulin glargin, which was daily, metformin, DPP-4, and again, a placebo weekly. So the, the treatment duration was of 26 weeks, and the primary endpoint was basically to see change in HbA1c from the baseline. And secondary endpoint was changing fasting, body weight, what was the SMBG profile of the patient in the last two weeks, and the hypoglycemia. So moving on to the results, here you can see there was hardly any difference between the change in HbA1c between Icodec and Glargin. With Icodec, it was minus 1.3%. And with glargin, it was minus 1.15%. Uh, very important point and very uh, uh, beautiful point here was that as the duration of the week increases, the, the dosage of Icodec was uh, perceived less by the patient. So there was hardly any difference between the secondary endpoints. There was only one major difference, which was the dose of insulin. So weekly dose of insulin of Icodec was 229 and weekly dose of glargin was 284. So it was concluded that once weekly treatment with insulin icodec had glucose lowering efficacy and safety profile was as similar to once daily insulin glargin. This was another phase two trial. In this, it was seen what happens when a person is shifted from a already existing basal to icodec. This was a multi-center open label treat to target phase two trial uh, it was for 16 weeks. Uh, the main author for the study, the main uh, primary author was Dr. Harpreet Brajaj. And we had an opportunity to listen from him in, during the last Ahuja Bajaj Symposium. So it was the, they were having type 2 diabetes patients who were already on basal insulin, almost like 10 to 50 units. The HbA1c ranged from 7 to 10%. There again were three arm. Point to be noted here is, first arm was, Icodec with initial 100% loading dose. That means if the patient requires, say, 70 units of insulin, the patient was given 140 units of insulin in the first week. That was only for the one week. And then the patient was given, say, about uh, 70 units in the uh, consequent weeks. Second arm was Icodec with no loading dose. So if the patient requires 70, it was given 70. And the third arm was uh, Glargin. Whatever units was required on a daily basis, it was started with 10 units per day. So the primary endpoint was percentage of time in range. That's a new concept right now during the last two weeks. And the secondary endpoint was basically what was the changes in HbA1c, adverse event and hypoglycemia. So here you can see this was the time in range of the uh, Icodec with loading dose, there's a marked difference from 58.9%, it rose to 72.9%. This was Icodec with not loading dose from 54%, it was to it was increased to 66%, and uh, Glargin arm was 58% to 65%. So there was a significant difference between the Icodec loading and 
large in hundred. So this difference was very significant. Uh, and there was a mean reduction on HbA1c. HbA1c was reduced from 7.9% to 7.1% in icodic loading arm and almost like 7.4 in both icodec uh, not loading and glargin and incidence rate of hypoglycemia was very similar to all the three arms so it was again concluded here that switching from daily basal insulin to insulin weekly icodec was well tolerated and it provided effective glycemic control and loading dose give better results. So there are many studies coming up now uh, bec of, bec uh, to find the dose titration, how to titrate the dose and all. So this will in coming years, we'll be getting to know more about it. Moving on to the second molecule, which is BIF. So this was uh, very recently published in April, May, to, uh, in, sorry, uh, it was published in May, 2021. It was a 32 week uh, randomized control trial. It uh, it, it was evaluating the safety and efficacy of BIF versus another basal insulin, Degludec. And uh, mean age was 60 years, baseline was 8.1%, and almost 14 years of duration of diabetes. It had almost 400 patients. And there were two uh, algorithms for the dosing of BIF. One algorithm targeted the fasting to less than 140, which is not that tight target and the other algorithm had uh, fasting blood glucose less than 120, little bit on the tighter side. And Degludec was titrated to 100, which was the tightest control in was seen in the patient with Degludec. So in this, you can see the time in range in all the three is almost similar. There is no difference between tighter titration, less tighter titration, or the more tighter titration with the Degludec. And the total duration of hypoglycemia was also similar in both the in both the arms here. So BIF actually showed similar glycemic control when it was compared with Degludec, despite higher fasting targets and numerically low time in hypoglycemia. The you can see it here. And the fa flat pharmacokinetic profile enables near peakless insulin concentration without an increase in hypoglycemia risk at higher exposure. So this is my last slide here. So Icodec, as I told you, that has three amino acid substitution and there's an addition of carbon-20 fatty acids to contribute the so slower receptor-mediated clearance. BIF is a longer-acting immunoglobin FC fusion protein. This weekly insulin gives a chance to choose 52 pricks over 365 pricks. Simple once weekly titration regimen could result in early adoption of insulin therapy and better compliance. Flat peak to turf profile could pro provide more consistent and predictable glycemic control with less glycemic variability. And phase two study in basal switch population has shown Similar efficacy with lower hypoglycemic rate come when compared to the comparator basal insulin, be it glargin or degludec. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Amrita. I think you're dot on time. Absolutely correct time. And uh, you have covered two insulins, uh, once a week insulin in a very nice manner. Uh, and uh, once they're approved, and once they come to India, as I said, it'll be blockbuster. Uh, we'll keep you into loop and keep on asking questions as the questions are coming. Uh, uh, one, uh, so Dr. Amrita, thank you. Uh, one question which has come, uh, which is related to previous lecture is uh, whether gliptins are to be avoided in the pancreatitis. Yes, absolutely. Gliptins uh, need uh, to be avoided in pancreatitis because there is a small chance that they may uh, actually exacerbate or cause pancreatitis. Uh, that chance is not much, but we have to be careful. Now with that, uh, I uh, take over um, uh, as for, with the next lecture, and which is also a very, very, uh, very important and new topic, because uh, this is something which is uh, so often seen by us non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Uh, every day we see this particular entity. And actually, uh, we don't know how to treat it. And uh, uh, Dr. Amrita, please uh, mute your uh, microphone. Um, 
So uh, we need to be very, very aware of what are the recent advances as far as the treatment of fatty liver disease is concerned. Uh, just to give you a background, a little bit of background, many of you know just a bit of overlap, maybe there uh, with the, some of the other presentations or some of your knowledge. Um, there's a worldwide epidemic of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and NFLD is ranked as number one cause of liver disease globally. Uh, NFLD is a clinical entity strongly related to metabolic syndrome and diabetes. This much is known to everybody. And what is important to note is it is uh, uh, increasingly reported from India. And there is some comparative data which shows that Indians have much more deposition of triglyceride for the same body weight, same BMI as compared to white Caucasian. So we are possibly predisposed to develop non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Now, this uh, is very important to know how it progresses to non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, progresses to uh, non-alcoholic steward of hepatitis, fibrosis, cirrhosis. Now, this particular uh, figure will very nicely has summarized a healthy liver. And you, on the right side, you see the picture how healthy this liver is. And then uh, fat in the liver, about approximately 25% of the population, maybe more in India, have non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, hepatocyte containing the fat. And then to non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, fat plus inflammation plus fibrosis. Now, this is important. Fibrosis here. And then unspecified number will develop cirrhosis. Non-alcoholic fatty uh, steatohepatitis may develop in around 6 to 7 percent of the general population, maybe more I'll, as I'll show you uh, in diabetic population. Now this uh, slide shows better. The steatosis, more than 5 percent of the fat in the liver. Non-alcoholic -al steatohepatitis, steatosis plus lobular inflammation plus hepatocellular ballooning and fibrosis. Why I'm, I'm, I'm repeatedly uh, uh, putting my emphasis on fibrosis is because fibrosis is something which is related to mortality. And this is a meta-analysis of five cohort studies, uh, which shows that as the fibrosis stage increases, and this is the uh, fibrosis stage here, the overall mortality increases. So this is something which we need to prevent from developing and maybe reverse. Now, this is the, our own data. Um, we have sent for publication 250 people, mean BMI of 31, all diabetic, duration of diabetic nine years. And you can see only 39% of these are without fibrosis and rest have various degrees of fibrosis, including 18% who have severe fibrosis. Now, these may not be very apparent and only once they progress to uh, further ascites and uh, marked liver dysfunction uh, and, and um, hematemesis, then uh, some come forward and then they are diagnosed. Let's go to the pharmacological treatment of NASH. Now, this is a summary of what is the current knowledge. Now, as far as targeting insulin resistance is concerned, and these have to be used in patients with diabetes, the, the prime drugs are pyridazone, liraglutide, semaglutide, exonatide, canaglifosin, and empaglifosin. Among these, the most robust evidence is for pyridazone, and this is the recommendation, may be used in patients with uh, diabetes and proven non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. So a biopsy is needed according to recommendation. And targeting oxidative stress used in non-diabetic individuals, vitamin E, and the, the recommendation may be used in non-diabetic uh, people uh, with a biopsy proven non-alcoholic uh, steatohepatitis. So this is the current knowledge. Now let's move on to fastenoid receptor, now a bit of colic acid, which is now in India. And this is, seems to be a promising candidate to treat liver fibrosis. Now, um, fastenoid receptor is right here. You can see here. Bile acid bind to it. And once they bind to it, the fastenoid receptor actually, uh, they, it leads to 
suppression of bile acid synthesis and more excretion. Now, this is uh, beneficial for liver. And you can see this obitecolic acid is an agonist of parsonide receptor, is a actually sister drug of chemodeoxy CDCA, which we know well, but highly potent for parsonide receptor. And so, again, it suppresses de novo synthesis of bile acids from cholesterol and increases transport of bile acid out of hepatocyte, thus reducing hepatic exposure to bile acid, which is good. And you can see it doesn't have only this action. There are multiple other actions. Uh, so free fatty acid synthesis and de novo lipogenesis also decrease, thus decreasing the fat accumulation. It has effect on multiple cytokines, decreasing inflammation and multiple fibrosis generators, thus decreasing fibrosis. So multiple action seems theoretically pretty good. So there are a number of studies. I have chosen two studies of abitocolic acid. And this is a double blind randomized control trial of 72 weeks. Placebo versus uh, the obitocolic acid, 141 versus 142, liver biopsy proven, and then substantiation on liver biopsy. Trial was stopped early because 45% of OCA group versus 21% in the plasma group achieved the endpoint, and that is NAF disactivity and worsening of fibrosis. And one side effect was noted, which, uh, which you have to be careful, is 23% developed pruritus. And you can see very well marked reduction in SGOT, HCPT, gamma glutamyl transpeptidase, and also some reduction in the weight. But what is more important to uh, is this particular trial. It was reported in 2019 in Lancet. Uh, and this is uh, uh, the multi-center randomized placebo control phase three trial, and which is continuing at the moment. And placebo versus obitocolic 10 milligram versus obitocolic 25 milligram uh, randomization and fibrosis improvement by more than one stage with no worsening of NASH was one end point and NASH resolution with no worsening of fibrosis was another end point. 18th month interim analysis of primary end points were done. And the inclusion criteria were biopsy confirmed NASH, fibrosis stage two or three, or NFLD activity score of more than four, all biopsy proven, pair red, and blinded. So there are 330 patients in the placebo group and 328 in the OCO uh, group. And you can see primary endpoint, fibrosis improvement with no worsening of NASH, you can see very well. Uh, placebo versus OCA 10 versus OCA 25, uh, a, a significant improvement, all statistically significant. This is intention to treat population. And NASH resolution with no worsening of fibrosis, again, significant improvement. And maximum with OCA 25. And you can see very well that the, as, uh, the hepatic transaminase is reduced significantly in, uh, um, uh, in OCA 10 and OCA 25 group. Uh, it was considered to be safe. There were two, two, three points to be considered. One, it decreased LDL cholesterol and so thus necessitating uh, uh, statin treatment in about 20% uh, of the 17% of the patient. Um, but overall, the cardiovascular events were similar in the placebo and the treatment group. There was some worsening of type 2 diabetes initially, but it was transient. And then by month six, uh, it returned back to normal. So both were tackled well and there was no long-term consequences. The main side effect is pruritus and in 25 milligram dose, 51% patient had pruritus. So summary of this uh, obitocolic acid and the trial um, uh, is that after 18 months of treatment, OCA improved liver fibrosis and expanded ITD population, demonstrated consistent efficacy in primary study results also improved steatohepatitis and liver biochemistry in patient with NASH and fibrosis stage one to three. Adverse events are mostly mild to moderate. Most common were consistent with null profile of obitocolic acid. And interim analysis based on surrogate endpoint considered 
reasonably likely to predict clinical benefit and long-term is OCA treatment effect on clinical outcome has yet to be demonstrated and the trial is going on. So this is my last slide. Non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, there's high disease burden, especially in Indian population who are suffering more from this and the, our livers are packed with fat. The presence of diabetes, obesity and metabolic syndrome further increases the burden and this is the high risk population and their early screening and diagnosis is important. Fibrosis stage is strong predictor for prognosis mortality, for progression, as well as for overall mortality. Regression of NASH and fibrosis is possible if we select lifestyle, if we select our treatment well, and obitacolic acid is one such drug which is promising. Uh, novel treatment, and this has been licensed for use for primary biliary cholangitis, FDA approved. And for NASH, is still FDA approval is pending. And as far as our experience is concerned, we have started using it uh, off-label in Indian population. And many of the gastroenterologists are also using it. So with that, I finish my presentation. Uh, we'll go on taking the questions as they come. At this point of time, I will hand over mic to Dr. Amrita Ghosh to take it forward. Dr. Amrita? Yes, sir. So after that prolific feast, let us move towards the dietary approaches for postprandial hypoglycemia. And for that, we have Dr. Seema Gulati, who is Director, Nutritional Research Group, NDOC. And Dr. Seema, over to you, ma'am. So you have to stop sharing. Yeah. Dr. Mishra, you have to stop. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, Dr. Amrita. Uh, yes, ma'am. You can share your yeah. slides. Yeah. Uh, my slides are visible? No. No? no. Okay. One minute. Cytokines which are inhibited are IL-2, IL-7, IL-16, IL-21. But also JAK-1 plays an important role in inhibition. Yeah, uh, uh, Seema, please yes. go ahead. Yes. So, thank you, sir. I'll be speaking on postprandial regulation of glucose with nutrients. The first metabolic alteration detectable in the progression of uh, diabetes is the loss of postprandial glucose control, which is an independent risk factor for T2DM. So as you can see here in this diagram, this white dotted line presents, uh, represents onset of diabetes. The pink one is postprandial glucose and the blue one is uh, fasting glucose. So we can see that fasting uh, uh, the postprandial hyperglycemia occurs about four to seven years before the fasting blood glucose begins to rise. So this is the point, as uh, Dr. Sujit Jha highlighted, when if lifestyle interventions are given, we can maybe arrest the progression of the disease. So recent studies have documented the importance of postprandial hyperglycemia as a risk factor for all cause and cardiovascular mortality in the normal population. And the main cause of postprandial hyperglycemia is the high carbohydrate need and reduced or delayed uh, insulin release in response to nutrient ingestion. So this is uh, from heart 2 d trial where five ethnic groups were uh, studied and uh, their blood glucose levels were assessed at seven time points. So all population irrespective of the geographical zones showed poor glycemic control post meals. This dotted line represents Indian population as we can see here that Indians showed poor glycemic control at all time points. So it's imperative that postprandial hyperglycemia is focused and uh, strategies to manage it should be 
researched and advocated. So in the following slides, I'll be discussing uh, some of the strategies which can be used in the management and prevention of postprandial hyperglycemia. First of all, I'll talk about carbohydrates. So carbohydrates are the primary dietary component uh, that influence blood glucose response. So Volivar in his study showed that carbohydrate content and glycemic index together explained about 90% of the variation in glycemic response. As you can see that when carbohydrate content was low and fat content was high, the area under curve was lower. So how carbohydrates, uh, they uh, will help in the management of postprandial hyperglycemia. If we decrease the content, then it leads to uh, increased lipolysis, decreased lipogenesis, decreased fatty acid concentration and decreased storage of adipose tissue. Now coming to fiber, Brian uh, in his study showed that uh, fasting blood glucose, mean blood glucose and area under curve were lower after increasing the fiber intake for a week. So if the fiber intake was increased, say, by uh, eight or nine grams, then it lead to decreased area under curve. Now, fiber uh, leads to delay in start digestion, transition of stomach contents into the duodenum, and uh, delay in hydrolysis of polysaccharides and also absorption time of monosaccharides. So this is uh, on protein. Like in a study of healthy individuals, it was shown that when whey protein was added to a pure glucose drink, the postprandial glucose area under the curve was decreased by 56%. This pink line shows whey protein and the green one shows the glucose. So we can see a clear cut difference in the area under curve. So this is our own study conducted by our group uh, where high uh, protein meal replacement was given for a period of three months. And apart from decrease in body weight and other metabolic parameters, we observed a significant decrease in postprandial glucose levels as well. Now coming to fats, a high MUFA diet uh, is definitely uh, decreases uh, postprandial glucose uh, peak. This work was shown by uh, Dr. Abhimanyu Garg also that when carbohydrates are replaced with high MUFA, the glycemic, uh, glycemic response is lowered. Here also we can see that you know high MUFA formula uh, uh, shows higher, uh, sorry, shows lower area under glucose and uh, as compared to the high carbohydrate formula. So uh, we talked about carbohydrate proteins and fats and if there are certain dietary articles which if included in the diet can help uh, manage the postprandial glucose peak like cinnamon, vinegar, fish oil, olive oil, yogurt, salads, legumes and nuts. Now, but there are uh, now new emerging approaches that if a non-carbohydrate macronutrient is added, is taken before the carbohydrate meal, the glucose response is lowered by as, much, as high as 40%. So if we preload each meal with the protein and fat, or we simple, simply tailor the sequence of macronutrients, like taking protein first and carbohydrate last, that can also help in the management of postprandial hyperglycemia. Similarly, Wu also showed that uh, if 25 grams of whey protein preload is given, then the effect on glucose lowering is as, as good as TPP4 inhibitors. Now, how a preload uh, strategy works, if we take a preload of non carbohydrate nutrient 30 minutes before the main meal, it leads to delay in gastric emptying, uh, decreased insulin clearance, improved beta cell function, and improved in creatin secretion. Now, a couple of studies have been conducted on this. A uh, soya yogurt, yogurt snack was given before meals and the glucose uh, peak decreased by 40%. Similarly, a 10 grams of fructose was given, a preload of fructose was given 30 minutes before the main carbohydrate meal and the area under curve decreased by 25%. And uh, again, nuts, very important, like 14 grams of nut preload, almond preload was given and a 15% decrease in postprandial uh, peak was observed. So uh, we had also conducted a trial with almonds where almonds were given to type 2 diabetic subjects. And at the end of the intervention, we noticed a significant drop in glycosylated hemoglobin. Similarly, Jenkins also showed that when almonds are included in the diet, there is a decrease of say about 21 to 42% in postprandial glucose peak. So keeping all this in mind, we 
planned or study evaluation of premium load of almonds on postprandial hyperglycemia and other metabolic variables in Asian with the, with the uh, pre-diabetes. The hypothesis of the study was that dietary intervention with almonds, 60 grams per day, uh, 20 grams before breakfast, lunch, and dinner will decrease the glucose and insulin excursion after meals and thus reduce the overall hyperglycemia. So this study was conducted in three phases, acute, subacute, and uh, chronic. The in acute phase, uh, uh, subjects in the almond arm, there were two arms, almond arm and the control arm. In the almond arm, uh, 20 grams of uh, preload was given uh, uh, of almonds. And uh, this was 30 minutes before uh, the ingestion of uh, 75 grams of glucose, while in the control arm, there was no preload given. So here we can see a, a significant decrease in area under curve for blood glucose and insulin as well. So in the subacute phase, we uh, used uh, continuous glucose monitoring device and uh, for three days, uh, it was fixed on uh, patients. And what we noticed that it was a crossover study. So this blue line shows the treatment arm or the um, uh, subjects who were given a preload of 20 grams of al almonds before uh, their meals. And the red line shows the control group. So this is the average of 60 patients over three days, 24 hours, we, see, we saw a clear cut, uh, you know, decrease. Sima, you in, have one, one more minute. Right, right. Thank you. So we could see a clear cut uh, decrease in the glycemic peaks. So here also, this is a, a report of one patient just one week apart. We can see when he was on control diet, we could see a lot of uh, perturbations in glucose, but the curve was flattened when the um, almonds were given as preload. So uh, here we can see high glycemic peaks. And this is day wise report. We could see like when, you know, uh, there was no preload, the, there were lots of peaks and as against when, uh, you know, almond preload was given. So to sum up, Asian Indians show higher postprandial uh, hyperglycemia in comparison to other ethnic groups, lower carbohydrate and higher uh, fat diets can be uh, uh, can be helpful in uh, dampening the postprandial glucose uh, spikes so emerging uh, research shows that pre meal ingestion of non carbohydrate food items can help control the postprandial hyperglycemia and statistical significant improvement in glucose insulin uh, levels were seen within 150 minutes of uh, preload of almonds as compared to a standard agtt CGM is done for 72 hours, showed significant lower postprandial glucose peaks in subjects ingesting premium load of 20 grams of almonds. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Seema, for this. We will take your questions a little later on because we are running a little late. Uh, so moving on, we are having an award ceremony for outstanding clinicians. And before that, I would like to tell all the participants to go and register yourself on the quiz after the award ceremony we will be having quiz. So, so Ahuja Bajaj Award uh, we are very happy to announce that the Outstanding Clinician Award is given to Dr. Gordas Chaudhary. Professor Gordas Chaudhary is Director, NHOD of Department of Gastroenterology and Hepatobiliary Sciences at FMRI Gurgaon. He is alumni of All India Institute of Medical Sciences. He is a prolific researcher and excellent teacher. Sir, uh, it's our immense pleasure to give you this award of Outstanding Clinician Award. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, no, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, please. No, it's a pleasure and an honor to accept this award. Uh, it's named after two teachers, both of whom taught us clinical medicine. And uh, I sometimes feel clinical medicine nowadays feels a little outdated, but it has its value. I am grateful to your organization and particularly Anup for recognizing the, the sustainable value of a clinical approach to medicine. And I think that if I have been able to do something in that direction, I feel extremely honored. Thank uh, you very much for this award. Uh, one more thing for all audience. Uh, Dr. Gorda Chaudhary took care of Dr. Bajaj 
in last uh, six to seven years when he was bedridden. Uh, and that is a kind of devotion to the teacher that we rarely see uh, these days. Thank you, Dr. Chaudhary. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to your organization and to Anu. Thanks a lot. Thank it's a thank great you. Thank you. Thank you so thank much, you. sir. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, our second award for the day goes to Dr. Atul Lutra. Dr. Lutra is alumni of Amritsar Medical College. He is an excellent teacher, dedicated researcher, and a gifted orator and a prolific writer. He has written many books on cardiology. He is director of uh, our center at CDOC at Fortis FMRI Gurgaon. So congratulations for this outstanding clinician award, sir. Oh, thank you, Amrita. And uh, I don't have words to thank Professor Mishra. Uh, I've been associated for over a decade. Uh, his unstinted support, encouragement, guidance is my most uh, valuable uh, possession after my teachers in uh, undergrad and postgrad. If I found a teacher, it is Professor Mishra. Thank you, sir, for this appreciation. I feel honored, but more importantly, I feel humbled. Thank, Thank you, sir. You. Thank you, Atul. Thank you. Congratulations. Congratulations, you, Dr. Lutra. Moving Thank on you. to our third uh, outstanding clinician award. It goes to Dr. Tapan Ghosh. He is director and head cardiology, director clinical research at Fortis Vasant Kunj. He is alumni of Assam Medical College. He is awarded cardiologist of the year in 2014. He is an avid researcher. So congratulations for this outstanding clinician award. Thank you. Thank you very much. I thank Professor Mishra and entire team for uh, you know, selecting me for this award. I accept this award humbly. I must tell that you know clinical medicine, uh, you know, being given recognition, it's it's a big thing, and I'm sure I'll be able to keep up to the expectations of this award and ethos of this award. I had an opportunity to you know be with Dr. Bajaj when he was uh, in Batra Hospital. And I was a junior consultant at that time. So we have interacted, we have learned many things from Dr. Bajaj. He also was the outstanding clinician. I think this award will, uh, you know, give a boost to clinical medicine. Thank you. Congratulations. Dr. Uh, Ghosh, uh, uh, I've seen you working and uh, Dr. Ritesh and everybody has seen you working and you are one of those uh, cardiologists who uh, still like to see the patient in totality, uh, make them lie on the bed and examine properly and use your stethoscope so wildly. So, so again, congratulations once more for that uh, uh, well-deserved award. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Congratulations, sir. Moving on to our last award. Uh, this award is given to Dr. Ritesh Gupta, who is my teacher, my mentor. He is a uh, he's a alumni of All India Institute of Medical Sciences. He is a avid researcher and a very good clinician. Uh, congratulations, Dr. Ritesh Gupta, for this outstanding clinician award. Thank you, Amrita, and thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Shah. Uh, I think I owe this award to my my training, to my teachers, and and uh, the chief among them is Dr. Misra. Uh, he has been the motivating force, not now only, but, but since, since the time I stepped into medicine, since the time I joined medical college. And, and uh, I remember uh, right on the, on the uh, when we joined the medicine and we were into clinical medicine for the first time in third semester, we were told that we have to, we have to memorize or know uh, the first 300 or 400 pages of Harrison, and this is this is what, uh, and this is from where I started interacting with Dr. Misra, and and it, and since then it has been a great journey, and it has been a pleasure and honor to to work with him now, and uh, and I uh, thank him uh, profusely. Thank you so much. Uh, congratulations, Ritesh. Uh, you have, we, this uh, award uh, is truly, uh, you know. Uh, just appreciation of your clinical abilities and the way you've worked uh, with all of us, uh, not only me, all of us. Uh, it has been uh, a quality work, I must say. So both you and Atul are uh, gems and uh, uh, asset in uh, any organization. And I'm 
very happy that you are with us. So thank you. And thanks, uh, Dr. Chaudhary, Dr. Raghosh, uh, for joining us. Uh, a, a, a proper, uh, you know, uh, award will be sent to you on your address uh, a little later. Uh, so no th th thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye bye. All the best. Thank you all. Uh, now we will moving, uh, moving with the uh, quiz competition. And before quiz, I would want to just acknowledge our sponsor, Novartis here. Yeah, for the quiz, please uh, register yourself and the quiz will start in just one minute. Over to you, Dr. Ritesh. Jay, you can uh, do the quiz live now. Okay. Okay. Shall I start the screen sharing, ma'am? Yes, please. Hello, everyone, and we'll be starting with the quiz. There are five questions. I think you need to first register for the quiz. There is a there is a uh, icon for quiz. You just click on that, and now the questions will appear, and you just have to click on the correct option. I hope my slides are visible very well. Yeah. Please. So let's have the first question. I encourage every one of you to please register so that we can start the quiz. We have attractive prizes for the first three answers. Jay, you can start. I think players will join in. You can you can start with yeah. the yeah. I think people will join in. Okay, so this is the first question. Oral semaglutide is recommended. We have the options. Option at the at the at the bottom. So uh, three, two, one. Yeah. So so this is the correct option, and five people have answered correctly. No, sorry. This is I cannot see the options here. So at the below side, you will get the option, sir. Below side of the screen. Hmm. Okay. Right. So, so the correct answer was on an empty stomach. Uh, that is how the absorption is best. And, uh, and five people have answered correctly. So let's move on to the second question. So, uh, this is the little bow for the first question. Okay. So, so we have the, the winners here. Seelam Rajita, Dr. S. Pal, and Dr. Abhishek are the, uh, the fastest, uh, who have given the fastest answer with the maximum points. So we can have the next question. Okay, so which of these oils has the highest content of monounsaturated fatty acids? And you have the options here.
Five seconds are remaining. Okay, so the time is up. Yeah, so the six people have answered correctly. It is the mustard oil which has the highest monounsaturated fatty acid content. And, and as we know, MUFA is, is beneficial not only for heart, but also reduces postprandial hyperglycemia, as Dr. Seema has shown in the last lecture. So uh, let's see who are the people who have answered it first. So Seelam Rajita, Dr. S. Pal, and Nidhi Singh are the, are the people who have answered fast, fastest, and they have the maximum points. So let's have the next question. Ubeticolic acid acts at which receptor? Time is up. Are the results? So, Farnesoid X receptor. Eleven people have answered correctly. That's great. And then let's let's see the responses. Silam Rajita again. Nidhi Singh and Dr. Abhishek. They have answered fastest. So, next move on to the fourth question. Anthocyanins are found in which food? Time's up. So cherries, yeah. So so they are found in cherries, and most of us have answered it correctly. Let's go to the letter four. So Jita, Rachita again, Nidhi Singh, and Dr. Abhishek. So they have answered in the shortest time. And let's move on to the last question here. Which of these effects can occur with the use of SGLT2 inhibitors? Time is up. answer is it can cause retinal vein occlusion and how it does is because it can raise hematocrit and that is how it can lead to some occlusion and, and retinal vein occlusion has recently been reported with the use of SGLT2 inhibitors so one needs to be aware of this, this entity. So let's see the leaderboard. Seelam Rajita of course has, has scored uh, the maximum points in all questions, and then Nithi Singh and Dr. Abhishek have also answered fast. So, so that brings us to the end of the quiz, and and uh, uh, I hand over to Dr. Misra to to for chairing the keynote session. Uh, if we can, uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, Dr. N. K. Aroda has joined. Uh, yes. Is he there on the? This one? Yeah, he's, he's just joined. Uh, oh, right. I can see him. Uh, wonderful. Wonderful. Uh, so, 
uh, thank you, Ritesh, for that very, very interesting quiz. Uh, Ritesh, you haven't told us uh, whether they will get a cash prize or what prize they will get. They'll they'll get a prize. We'll 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 announce it uh, probably uh, after a couple of lectures. Yeah. Okay. Fine. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so please be uh, there uh, for uh, very interesting sessions coming up uh, subsequently. And the most interesting session and the keynote address is the next one, which is on COVID-19 vaccines and virus variant. Everybody, the whole country, in fact, the whole world is talking about it. And here is none other than the chief of the National Technical Advisory Group on Immunization, NTA GI India, who decides on the vaccine policy, on the immunization policy, and who's my friend and a very, very eminent uh, researcher, clinician, a professor of pediatrics from All India Institute of Medical Sciences, and then chief of Inclan, whose uh, uh, mind remains uh, razor sharp for uh, you know, research, academics, Me and clinical medicine. Uh, a, a wonderful human being and an apt person to actually talk about this issue. So, uh, uh, NK, uh, as I call him, NK, thank you for accepting this uh, invitation. I know you're very busy and you are in the, uh, you know, uh, with the high powered group and uh, with the prime minister and everybody. Uh, thank you for taking out that 15 minutes of time. Please go ahead and uh, uh, start your lecture. NK, you are uh, mute. NK, you are on the mute. Yeah. You're mute, NK. Uh, yeah. No. Now we thank, can you. Uh, thank you, Anup, uh, for uh, inviting me. And uh, I'm so glad that uh, I have the opportunity to share some of the uh, ongoing things in the country regarding vaccines and variants. So can I sh uh, share my uh, screen? Uh, you have slide you can share yourself? Yes, yeah. Uh, and you see my... Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, I can see. We can see. If you can maximize the slide. Yeah, I'll do that. So I will, uh, just to give you a brief outline, I'll talk about the various vaccines, the, the concept of COVID vaccines, that means different platforms. I'm sure it, some of it may be revision uh, for a lot of us, but still, I think it is worthwhile. Then I will talk about the genomic surveillance. I, I think that is the highlight and cutting edge science, which has been inbuilt into the public health system in our country for the first time and how we are moving uh, overall uh, in this direction. So just to give you a, a worldview that uh, there are almost 300 vaccine, candidate vaccines which are under various phases. And uh, we need to kind of, and that's why we keep on hearing about new vaccines. And as you can see, the key issue is that you, we need to understand uh, the, the, these are, Protein and these are platforms, protein subunit, viral vector, DNA, inactivated, RNA, viral vector replicating virus like particle and then uh, a mixture of others. So at least five or six uh, uh, platforms are very necessary and some of these are being used for human uh, beings for the first time, RNA and DNA vaccine. An Indian DNA vaccine is going to be the world's first DNA vaccine for human consumption. This is the Indian landscape. We have Covishield, or, which is also called AstraZeneca. It has got chimpanzee adenovirus, and it is a non-replicating viral vector vaccine. And uh, it is already been given in emergency use authorization. We have a totally indigenous vaccine. This vaccine was primarily with the Oxford University. Now, Bharat Biotech and ICMR has uh, got up this vaccine, which we called as Covaxin. And then another vaccine, which is now they have started manufacturing in India, but primarily from Russia. And this is uh, based on, again, viral vector, two types of vectors are there. 
adenovirus 26 and adenovirus 20 uh, at 5 and uh, these vaccines are given at uh, three week uh, interval and emergency use authorization yesterday uh, uh, emergency use authorization for johnson and johnson has been given and prior to that moderna i have deliberately not put moderna because uh, uh, there are issues and it's, it has not come it is almost four weeks I'll talk towards the last slide how Johnson is likely to work because Johnson is a little different. There is a possibility that it will be manufactured in huge quantities within India. Then we have uh, various other vaccines coming up in India. Particularly, you might be hearing about protein subunit vaccine of biological E. This vaccine will come in October and government has already paid 30 crores, uh, 30, uh, 30, for 30 crore doses for this vaccine. And this is in uh, going in phase three in next one or two weeks. This is another vaccine, uh, Bharat Biotech uh, vaccine. It is an adenovectored vaccine. Remember, Bharat Biotech has co-vaccine, which is an inactivated whole virion vaccine. Here it is adenovector, and this is what is called nasal vaccine, single dose. And so this is uh, in clinical phase uh, one and uh, very soon phase three uh, would be also started. I will draw your attention to another vaccine, which is RNA vaccine by Genova. And this is going to be a very uh, important, uh, I would say a milestone because RNA vaccine, everybody is excited. And this is probably going to change the scenario of the whole world, uh, vaccinology world, and even for other therapies. DNA vaccine, I have missed out. It is, in fact, DNA vaccine is going to be somewhere very much here. And uh, this is uh, uh, going to be uh, Cadilla Zydus DNA vaccine. I think in the coming week, we should hear a good news about this vaccine getting uh, 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 emergency use authorization. Now, why, when I talk about variants and when I talk about vaccine, the key issue is that whether the vaccine is effective against the circulating virus. And uh, virus effectiveness, here I would just take a break and try to explain what does effectiveness mean. Effectiveness means three things. One is effectiveness is uh, for whether it prevents transmission. So most of the vaccines, irrespective, whatever they are, not very effective, and it's only about 50%. Second effectiveness is against mild disease, moderate disease, severe disease. And this is the word you hear across that it is 75%, 80%, 90%, 95%. When you hear about various vaccines, this is the effectiveness you are hearing, and that is, uh, the, uh, the, that is the second effectiveness. And the third effectiveness, which is practically and clinically most important, is, is the effectiveness for prevention against severe disease, hospitalization, and death. Now, this is the key component which we need to uh, be uh, very kind of worried. Now, the good news is that all the available vaccines in India are almost 95% effective against severe disease, hospitalization, ICU care, and death. That means that that is the one which kills. That is the one which we are worried. Otherwise, as you are all aware, and all of us are aware that uh, corona is a mild URI-like illness. Now, this start, um, I am presenting to you a UK data and which shows that if in unvaccinated, if we take this as a reference and alpha variant, which is the one predominantly, just don't look at other uh, columns. If one dose is given 50% effectiveness and this effectiveness includes mild disease, moderate disease, severe disease, all kinds of disease. So it's the second type of effectiveness I, I talked about. 
and when two doses are given it becomes 87% any kind of vaccine now when we talk about the this bnt 162b2 is basically pfizer vaccine and same 47% and 93% again i am talking about second type of effectiveness and then chedox or for us it is covishield it is the same single dose 50% two doses 75% effective now when i look at delta variant you have all heard about delta variant today 90% of the uh, the circulating virus is delta variant and for this it is 30 versus 80% 35 versus 88% and 30 versus 67%. So single dose is less effective and therefore two doses are necessary from this data. Okay. Now this is from Canada and we will look at uh, vaccine effectiveness for delta. Forget about alpha and beta gamma because it is delta which is important. When we look at Pfizer it is single dose 56% two doses 87% moderna 72% and after single dose astrazeneca or covi shield is 67% not bad at all this is and now the important point is this is symptomatic disease the second type of effectiveness now let us look at the third type of effectiveness when you give one dose of pfizer it is 78% when you give one dose of moderna it is 96% and when you give one dose of astrazeneca it is 88% the important lesson is that for serious disease all vaccines are very similar this is 95% confidence interval which is overlapping so what i am trying to say is not to be worried about what vaccine you are getting whatever vaccine you are getting it prevents death it prevents hospitalization now this is indian data csir uh, lab people and it is breakthrough or vaccine efficacy now when we look the uh, and it is not according to the particular vaccine but it is a mixture of both covaxin and covi shield when you look at the protective effect of one vaccine one dose uh it is 61% fully vaccinated 68% now this is the second type where that means mild moderate severe disease and now hospitalization 70% and 64 very similar with single dose or double dose and oxygen therapy 94% here there was no patient and needed icu care 95% what basically i am trying to say is that our indian data and this is protective effect of two doses just look at this 61 65 70% hospitalization 77% uh, two doses single dose oxygen therapy requirement 94% 92% icu care 95 94% again the same message vaccines are preventing death whichever vaccine is available let us not wait for pfizer's and moderna now this is a series of studies done in india with about breakthrough after vaccine so it is looks like it is variable across the country in chandigarh and apollo hospital delhi the breakthrough is around 2 to 5% 6% partially means single dose fully vaccinated two dose molana zad 10% uh, uh, uh anoops study has showing 13% breakthrough in diabetes individuals and uh, then in uh, south uh, in central india 18% icmr any vaccination 4.5 what i am trying to tell you the, this breakthrough infections are mostly mild infection and they do not kill you just to give you an idea jnj has been uh, uh, received has received Uh, uh emergency use authorization last evening and this is the data which shows i will just like to show you about delta variant 
this is quite effective against Delta variant also. And uh, the highlight of this is single dose. This is neutralizing antibodies for Delta as compared to the standard, and it is not significantly reduced. 117 is alpha. Now, I thought I will quickly take you through genomic surveillance and genetic epidemiology because this is the highlight and this will save us from future uh, waves. And a, a, a network of 10 institutions have been created. These are world class and it is an example of health, biotechnology, CSIR, IS, ICMR, all working together in the same direction. The, the whole philosophy is that this is a proposal where sequencing is done, uh, sentinel sequencing, switch sequence surveillance has started just like polio, a hospital network has been established. One is looking at impact on immunity to and also to assess long-term impact on uh, of COVID complications. Infrastructure has been created and then now it is an open public domain. I will just show you the website. And I'm sure all of you are aware the key four components of any variant is transmissibility, severity of disease, risk of reinfection, and impact on diagnostics. The important point, first of all, to remember that there is no impact on diagnosis. You are able to diagnose with the same PCR. The transmissibility delta is the highest transmissible uh, variant. Disease severity does not appear that anything, any of the variants is increasing severity. We should also remember any variant which causes more severe disease is a self annihilation process. Because if it's severe disease, then the patient will die and the virus will die. So this is uh, nature's uh, process of, uh, of, of self uh, survival. And risk of reinfection is there is a neutralizing effect is maximum with Delta. This is what is creating havoc now in North America, Europe, Southeast Asia, etc. Now, this is the rise of Delta in India, right from April 2020. Many times say, Hamara, there is no kuch nahi hora. Nahi, aisa nahi. This, uh, this genomic sequence is going on. But in true uh, spirit, this, this was more, I, I would say, in a, uh, in a uh, amateurish manner. But now a, a network has been sought up from December onwards. And this brown is the Delta variant. And this is what created havoc for us in second wave. And you see in March, it starts. It is first appeared in February. January, there were occasional cases. February, few and then it started taking, it was Maharashtra from where it started. And then within six or eight weeks, it just overtook everything else. And today, 94% is as of July 29th, it is 94%, uh, it is Delta. And a uh, huge number of, uh, uh, of uh, sampling is being done at the moment. 41,000 samples, uh, community samples have been sequenced. And now uh, alpha variant, the numbers we have identified and the maximum is a delta variant, which is 17,000 plus. And in all these states, it is being done. The proportion of cases with VOC has been consistently rising from 10% in May to 58% in July. Now VOC includes all. Alpha, Beta, Gamma, Delta, Kappa. AY1 and AY2 is basically Delta plus. There was a lot of concern, but it has now uh, known that no, it is not a problem. It is just to show one example in Punjab. Punjab started with Alpha. Uh, sorry, this is second wave. Uh, first wave. First wave of the Wuhan virus. It is here that in March, uh, people brought uh, alpha variant from uh, UK and there was a hum. But very soon, Delta variant took over within four weeks and it became uh, in first last week of April and first week of May, the Delta just took over completely. And this is just shows yellow one is 
यूके के वेरियंट फेब्रवरी मार्च अप्रैल में आधा रह गया मे फिनिश जून डिस सो इट ऑल डिपेंड्स हाउ रैपिडली दी वायरस इज सर्कुलेटिंग एंड ओवरटेकिंग सो दो माइल्डर वेरियंट आर जस्ट ओवर शेडोड now these research questions are being talked up uh, we are looking at it which vocs are causing more severe disease what is the association with outcome what is the association with prolonged illness and recurrent illness any predisposition to fungal illness and long term complications in general and vocs in particular and then there are clinical epidemiological questions like risk factors and uh, what are the risk factor what how what is the outcome and its relationship and risk factors for post covid sequelae because everybody does not get it so in summary continuing outbreak across india are attributable to delta a susceptible population and a opportunity for transmission public health measures to reduce transmission and vaccination remain critical and a cluster of cases containing new mutations of non clinical significance will be specifically looked for because we are looking for third wave immune escape is imp most important property for new variants and uh, the uh, but it appears that because of the recent zero positivity uh, two third of the population is now positive we should not uh, see too much of problem in coming months this is i picked up deliberately in the towards the end that what have we learned so far that newly recognized uh, vocs variants of concern are indicating that they need close monitoring on a global variant because hamare yahan aaj pareshani hui hai log hum pe has rahe the march april may mein but uh, we should not be laughing on them because they are facing the same music these are Uh, these are really uh, uh, ferocious viruses the second important and i think this is very important and this is what i was trying to tell you and the biology behind it is that even when immune responses are they partially escape immune uh, uh, humoral immunity the t cell activation is not affected by mutations and this is very important that khali mein antibody jo level karata hu this is not correct and uh, various factors which lead to or help in uh, uh, in developing immune responses irresponsible and irrational use of therapy remdesivir plasma therapy then uh, uh, the basic nature of the virus the association of uh, uh, immuno the issues of immunocompromised patient so we need to be careful particularly in these situations where immune escape can occur and this is my last slide to just to show this is the website and you can get all the information as and when every week we come out with a bulletin and uh, uh, everything is transparently shared with uh, both community scientific community and uh, global community thank you very much uh, for the opportunity and i'll be very happy to take questions uh, thank you uh... and uh, that was wonderful lecture i think uh, lots of doubts have been cleared uh, usually we don't allow questions in a keynote uh, lecture uh, but uh, just one question to you which is in everybody's mind will the third wave come to india that is one question so third wave uh, uh, we need to be careful and we have to proactively and preemptively prepare for ourselves one is as i showed you genomic surveillance and a nationwide network is in place the whole country 350 districts are now being sampled and plus or everything else i showed you second is that uh, immunization uh, is uh, picking up and you know that as of day before yesterday we had completed 50 crore doses by the end of the year we the vaccine supply has been assured so that all adults above the age of 18 years get um, the vaccines 100% two number three corona appropriate behavior now corona appropriate behavior is at two levels 
at individual level so we keep on saying mask and social distance and hygiene but corona appropriate behavior is also important from a societal perspective social gatherings religious gatherings political gatherings must be avoided because that is very necessary fourth one is strengthening our health system and a very systematic effort maybe uh, sometime later i can talk to you uh, the group about this but a major 23000 crores are are being spent to strengthen health system across the country whatever temporary structures were erected during phase 2 wave 2 now are being converted into permanent special efforts are being made for pediatrics every medical college will have a floor for pediatric covid in addition all corporate hospitals have been also asked and district hospitals oxygen plant every hospital above the uh, 100 bedded will have to have a psa uh, oxygen plant and uh, it is expected by 31st september the whole country will have so this is a four pronged strategy for preparing ourselves and now finally in view of the recent zero survey from icmr which shows 67% positivity in northern india is almost delhi and surrounding area is almost 80% positive risk of another variant uh, uh, another wave is unlikely we have a window period of 6 to 8 months uh, uh, and uh, all new waves are driven by a variant and for that uh, the system is pretty geared thank you thank you uh, nk for that a wonderful lecture and a voice of reason amongst all the confusion that is uh, going on in the world uh, thank you for showing us the way and thank you for coming here uh, and uh, i'm sure we'll engage you in another discussion as you rightly said sub sub sometimes later so so uh, once again thank, thank you, you. my yeah. pleasure thank you very much uh, dr amrita please uh, take the program forward yes sir so after that uh, wonderful feast let move on to another sweet topic can honey be used in diabetes so this topic will be dealt by sugandha kehar she is in charge intervention studies with nutrients at endoc sugandha over to you are the slides visible yes yes sir yes it is visible good afternoon i'll be speaking on can honey be used in diabetes Honey is a thick and sweet liquid made by honey bees. For a long time in history, honey was an important source of carbohydrate and the only largely available sweetener until it was replaced by industrial sugar in 1800. Until then, it was not only used as food but also as a medicine. Honey has been used in Ayurvedic medicine in India for more than 4000 years. also many religious books including holy quran and holy bible also speaks about honey there are two types of honey based on its uh, origin nectar honey or floral honey it is collected by honey bees from the nectar of the flowers as we can see in the picture forest honey is also called as honey dew honey it is produced by bees from the oak forest it is not made with the nectar of the flowers but from the sugary solution that bees collects from the leaves of the trees uh, forest honey is considered superior than nectar honey in terms of its composition but nectar honey is the one most commonly used and widely available in markets there are over 300 types of nectar honey available in the world global production of honey Uh, approximately 1.20 million annum uh, per year honey is produced china turkey and iran are the main makers of honey followed by argentina us and india in india punjab haryana and himachal pradesh are major honey producing states followed by bihar and west bengal honey's composition honey is a complex product made with sugars Uh, water and many other substances it is mainly composed of 17% moisture 80% carbohydrate and a great number of minor components 
the composition the precise composition of honey varies according to the plant species from which honey is obtained or bees obtain honey but the main constituents remain the same in this 3% content honey consists of several amino acids of uh, vitamins such as vitamin b c minerals such as iron calcium copper zinc selenium chromium magnesium potassium several enzymes flavonoids phenolic acids and other antioxidants now we'll talk about this 80% content in detail carbohydrate composition in honey varies depending upon its botanical and geographical origin its purity and quality honey contains 38% fructose and 31% glucose and this is where honey gets its sweetness from from glucose fructose and some amount of sucrose the fructose in honey plays a very important role we'll quickly go through the characteristics of fructose fructose is the most abundant sugar in honey fructose has low glycemic index it has a glycemic index of 19 while glycemic index of uh, glucose is 100 and sucrose is 60 uh, this is 60% sucrose yeah uh this is uh uh because of the honey uh, because of high fructose content in fru- uh, in honey fructose uh, has low glycemic index and because of high content of fructose in honey honey also has a low glycemic index another interesting properties of fructose is that its absorption in gastrointestinal tract is lower than glucose and its metabolism occurs independently from insulin meaning that its uptake into tissue does not depend upon insulin moreover fructose also helps in metabolism and utilization of glucose so uh, this combination of fructose and glucose in honey further enhances glucose uptake and glycogen synthesis this mechanism of fructose helps in reducing rate of intestinal absorption it increases its gastric emptying time and eventually reduces food intake this table here shows that honey has low glycemic index calories and carbohydrate then sugar and glucose and it has fairly good amount of calcium iron magnesium phosphorus potassium vitamin b and water content that are negligible that are present in negligible amount or not present at all in honey and sugar taking talking about glycemic index glycemic index of honey varies from 60 to or from 40 to 60 depending upon its composition we can understand uh, we can understand glycemic index of honey with help of few ogtt studies an ogtt study was conducted in egypt on 20 type 1 diabetic and 10 healthy children here glucose sucrose and honey were administered to each subject and it was observed that glycemic index and post incremental index were lower when honey was ingested as compared to glucose and fructose this is an indian study uh, it was conducted in gwalior on 30 subjects with parental history of type 2 diabetes uh, here on day 1 subjects were given 75 g of glucose and next day they were given 90 g of honey the plasma glucose levels were monitored at fasting and at every 30 minutes interval up to 2 hours and glucose tolerance test curves were plotted out for both the days and this was the result this is a uh, glucose and this is honey we can clearly see that honey exerted higher level of plasma glucose at all given points uh, glucose peaked at around 225 mg per deciliter whereas uh, honey peaked at 155 mg per deciliter at 60 minutes 
This study was carried out in Romania. Here, different sources of carbohydrates. Simple uh, carbohydrates such as glucose, fructose, and lactose, and complex carbohydrates such as honey, rice, bread, potato, carrot, and apples were ingested to patients to study blood glucose and plasma insulin responses. And here is the graph. This is the result. Here we can see clearly that among all the test groups, honey and carrot gave the lowest blood glucose increase. This uh, this table here contains summary of studies showing effect of honey ingestion among diabetic subjects. Uh, there is lack of sufficient data on honey consumption. The studies conducted are for short duration of time and with limited number of subjects. I'll quickly go through uh, the summary briefly. So this study was conducted in India on 48 subjects with diabetic neuropathy. 0 0.5 gram of honey per kilo body weight per day was ingested for three months. So then we have one more minute to go. It, uh, reduction in uh, fasting blood glucose, triglyceride, and uh, a pain score and symptoms from diabetic neuropathy were observed. Another study was conducted in Turkey among diabetic and non-diabetic subjects. Honey was given at different doses of 5 gram, 25 gram, and, 20, uh, and 15 gram for four months. At the end of the study, a significant reduction in HbA1c in all honey groups were observed. Uh, with this study, Sadgi et al. Uh, study was carried out in Iran on 42 subjects. Participants were di uh, divided into two groups, honey group and no honey group. The treatment group received 50 gram of honey per day for eight weeks. Here, a significant decrease in weight, waist circumference, BMI, and a non-significant increase in HbA1c observed in honey group. An Egyptian study uh, among 20 diabetic subjects resulted in hyperglycemia at a dose of 150 gram of honey per day for three months. Brahmi et al. study uh, was conducted in Iran on 48 diabetic adults for eight weeks. The treatment group received honey at a dose of one gram per kg uh, body weight per day for first two weeks and a dose of 0 0.5 gram per day was increased after every two weeks. Uh, the study resulted in reduction in weight, uh, improvement in lipid profile, and increment in HbA1c. So uh, this is the conclusion here. Uh, there is paucity of randomized control trials. Well-designed studies are needed to examine long-term metabolic consequences of honey digestion. All studies showing glycemic index of honey showed that their honey has low glycemic index, whereas the studies showing effect of honey consumption on glycemic control and insulin resistance are inconsistent. As we discussed in the summary table, few studies showed decrease in HbA1c, while others resulted in hyperglycemia on honey intake. Uh, it could be largely due to the dosage of honey, uh, therefore, optimum dose of honey consumption must be established and longer period of uh, longer period experiments must be developed uh, due to the fact that uh, uh, diabetes is a chronic disease. Thank you. Thank you, Suganda. Uh, Dr. Mishra, can we move yeah, on to the next one, sir? Yeah, yeah thank you, Suganda, uh, for that very nice presentation. So, as I understand, uh, uh, we can take honey or we can may not take honey. <laughs> Both the things are there in your presentation. But uh, uh, yes, I totally agree with you that more studies are required and maybe a, a small dose of honey may not uh, harm, but a larger doses of honey may increase uh, hemoglobin A1c. And the effect must be seen in non-diabetic, diabetic, diabetic uh, and other category of people. So uh, I'm sure there'll be more questions on the chat box and we will like to respond to chat box uh, questions as uh, we go along with the program. Now, the next is a very interesting panel discussion and this is what everybody has been talking about. And we have had a good uh, uh, run up from Dr. N.K. Aroda 
who gave a, a, a good insight into the uh, vaccinations and uh, genomics and what is the situation in India. We move on to insights about post-COVID syndrome, so-called long COVID. So I would like uh, to invite uh, my whole team, Dr. Atul Lutra, uh, please uh, um, be on the panel. Dr. Alka Jha, Dr. Sweety Agrawal, who's recently joined us uh, as a consultant endocrinology in uh, Fortis Gurgaon, Dr. Ritesh Gupta, Dr. Amrita Ghosh. Sweety? Yes, sir. Uh, on, please sir. Uh, have your video on. Yes, sir. I'm on, sir. Okay. Fine. So, uh, so let me just... Um, explain to you what uh, the post-COVID syndrome is, and we have recently written about it. Uh, up to six weeks post-acute uh, COVID, there are symptoms which may persist due to acute COVID itself. Uh, and after six weeks of uh, uh, discharge from hospital or, um, you know, stoppage of fever and things like that, then if the symptoms persist and they are not explained by alternative diagnosis, then it is called post-COVID. Now, long COVID is a, wrong, uh, is a misnomer because it appears that the COVID is going on in this long COVID. And there are some other definitions also, but I'll keep it simple six weeks. Before that, acute symptoms are going on or something related. And after six weeks, uh, symptoms go on, which are uh, not explained by alternative diagnosis. The One of the most common symptoms is fatigue and uh, followed by myalgia, headache, uh, um, uh, the, uh, um, you know, diarrhea, chest pain, shortness of breath, number of symptoms. Now, uh, this is a very uh, sparsely researched area. We don't know much about it. We don't know about etiology also. Uh, but we will, as we go along, we'll give you some insights into the things and we'll ask our experts about uh, various aspects of post-COVID syndrome. So, number one question is to Dr. Amrita. Uh, lots of people of COVID-19 after discharge uh, have a problems with the nutrition. Now, nutrition is something which is uh, uh, least... Uh, advised after COVID. I would say hardly any team, COVID team, has nutritionist uh, as a major person advising people after the child. So how do we tackle nutrition post-COVID and what kind of nutritional deficiency uh, can we see in these people? Uh, so we have recently concluded a study uh, in post-COVID and association with post-COVID fatigue in almost 50 diabetes patients. And we will be publishing that soon. So uh, in that study also, we have noted that there was a marked, uh, uh, there was weight loss in patient and their nutrition was very poor. So talking about what nutrition, how nutrition, uh, how nutrition can be improved in these kind of patients, the main focus should be given on the major macro protein, uh, macronutrient protein, and uh, complex carbohydrates should be increased in this kind of patients. Uh, these patients also have some kind of uh, uh, gastrointestinal issues also. So maybe uh, addition of probiotic, uh, prebiotic food should also be added in their diet. But uh, in my opinion, uh, protein is the mainstay because all these patients, all the patients of diabetes are also having sarcopenia along with uh, sustain COVID for a longer duration of time. There is muscle mass loss. So protein is very essential in these kind of patients. So I think nutrition is uh, given less importance uh, too. And uh, we should involve nutritionists with all COVID team and post-COVID rehabilitation team. Uh, and nutrition advice should be a part and parcel of post-COVID treatment. And among them, protein is one. And then then one, one may, may do a couple of tests to see whether there's a micronutrient deficiency, vitamin deficiency is going on. And if they're going on, then appropriately they should be supplemented. So thanks, uh, Amrita, for uh, answering that question. Uh, we go on to Sweetie uh, Agarwal. Um, now, uh, 
you know, many of our diabetes patients have had COVID in April. April was uh, uh, when the second wave was at the peak. And they, even two months, two and a half months, three months have passed, and then people are still complaining of problems. So what do you think about how diabetes, uh, what is the relationship between diabetes and post-COVID symptoms and whether uh, blood sugar fluctuations, etc. have anything to do with uh, post-COVID symptoms? Sweetie. Thank you, sir, for that question. Um, I think it's a very pertinent question, but probably we might not have absolutely clear answers to it right now in terms of numbers. All uh, What we know for sure is that COVID certainly produces more severe illness and greater number of complications in patients who have had diabetes. And uh, we've also seen that patients with uh, severe COVID are the ones who are more likely to get a post-COVID syndrome or, uh, and severe symptoms like fatigue and breathlessness. So by, by that analogy, we might actually conclude that these patients may probably be more prone to get a uh, fatigue or breathlessness or other typical post-COVID syndromes, even though we don't have clear numbers uh, there. Uh, when I try to look up at data, all we have actually is a study which has been done from our very own center uh, led by Dr. Mishra and his team, where they have tried to look at uh, uh, the prevalence of fatigue using the uh, CFS uh, in patients with diabetes who have had for, um, COVID in the past and compared them with patients who have not had COVID. So what they found was that up to 67% of patients with diabetes have uh, um, severe fatigue uh, in, uh, when they have um, had given a history of COVID infection in the recent past. And this was as compared to a prevalence of around 37% in the non-COVID group. That probably tells us or is a pointer towards uh, uh, what we have been hypothesizing that uh, patients with diabetes are probably more prone to get uh, uh, fatigue and uh, related post-COVID syndromes. One of the reasons for this fatigue might well be uncontrolled blood glucose which have been contributed to because of addition of steroids you know because of dietary variations and certainly uh, the sarcopenia following any acute illness is something as prolonged and severe as covid would, would also contribute but surely just like dr arora pointed out in, in, in one of his last slides that this is one of the research questions where we are trying to look at what could be the risk factors for a post-COVID COVID syndrome? And uh, we might get more answers in the future as the pandemic progresses and we have more data coming up. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sweetie. There are a couple of risk factors uh, for uh, post-COVID syndrome which are already apparent uh, from some studies. And uh, one is clearly, the, as you rightly said, a hospitalization for a prolonged period of time. Uh, women are more prone to that and people who have more than five symptoms during the acute COVID, various kind of symptoms, they are also more prone. And somehow uh, the antibody surge after the COVID, which may may uh, explain a high, uh, very severe disease um, previously, um, is also uh, somehow correlated to post-COVID syndrome. But uh, you rightly said, uh, in diabetes, there are no studies and uh, uh, we need more data, we need more research, uh, and there are so many things which are similar between diabetes and COVID-19. That is something which is intriguing, because one of the symptoms which is uh, common is possibly autonomic nerve dysfunction. And that's where uh, Ritesh comes in. Ritesh, many of the COVID patients uh, complain of tachycardia which goes on. One of my patients was a who just, uh, uh, you know, not hospitalized, was treated at home, you know, not very severe. But two months have gone by, his heart rate continues to be 105, 110. What do you think about that and what do you say about that? Uh, Ritesh, your voice is not... Hello, hello. I'm, am I yeah. audible? Yeah, yeah. 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 So, uh, rightly said, sir, the, the uh, uh, tachycardia or the autonomic uh, symptoms are are uh, very frequently seen in, in post-COVID syndrome patients recover, uh, who have recovered from COVID. The reasons are not very clear. Uh, cytokine storm could be responsible, but then, as you said, uh, some patients who have not had severe COVID, who presumably did not have a pro pronounced cytokine storm, even they are having autonomic dysfunction. And... And it could be immune-mediated, 
by the virus or as you said antibody mediated we are not very clear but uh, tachycardia or uh, uh, is very common and there is a syndrome called postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome which occurs when you stand up basically when the patient stands up and there is a there is a rise of about 30 uh, beats per minute and and that that causes a lot of uh, discomfort and then of course there can be vasovagal syncope and orthostatic hypotension which also is very frequently seen and this basically occurs because of increased adrenergic drive and which uh, which leads to vasodilatation and then and then in turn mm-hmm. paradoxical vagal stimulation and syncope now uh, we need to be aware of this we need to uh, if the patient has such symptoms needs to be examined you need to check blood pressure and pulse in supine and standing position and if it is found to be uh, there then one needs to treat it in a way in, in a similar way as you treat any other orthostatic hypotension uh, uh, including education patient education uh, exercise if the patient is not able to stand up and exercise or walk then uh, he or she should be made to exercise in the bed itself the, the cycling uh, while lying down something like that or isometric exercise like ten- tensing of uh, thigh muscles tensing of buttock muscles all that can help in in uh, in relieving these symptoms and and uh, and one very important uh, consideration is the offending drugs uh, many of these patients are on on uh, duloxetine or paroxetine or or uh, tramadol for chronic pain and all these drugs uh, increase the norepinephrine and and that that they should be avoided or discontinued and uh, then fluid intake and salt intake as we know should be should be attended to and in rare cases you may have to use uh, fluticortisone etc and uh, beta blockers also have a role a limited role in 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 uh, treating if the patient if the main symptom is tachycardia though they can even pronounce orthostatic hypotension so one needs to be uh, very careful and a sound clinical judgment is required thank you ritesh and you brought in a very important point of that of exercise you know one of my patients uh, came and said well th- my doctor has said not to exercise for 3 months and everybody in the colony is saying if you exercise you will drop dead one of these days so uh, it don't stress your heart so it is true we are not going to stress the heart but a gradual exercise must begin as soon as possible now it will de- depend on uh, uh, various patient to patient and uh, uh, physician discussion comes here but a gradual exercise of multiple modality so some amount of walking some amount of uh, resistance exercise some amount of bed exercise static exercise as you have already said uh, um, stretching <clears throat> so all sorts of things must be started and gradually increase up. and uh, here a supervision by a physician or a physiotherapist is very very important because i feel that exercise can have multi pronged effect on the brain on the uh, pulmonary sufficiency on the heart on the on the kidney on the sarcopenia on neuropathy and also autonomic uh, uh, dysfunction so i think this is something which uh, uh, leaves uh, uh, a lot of room to for improvement now um, that uh, as far as that nerves and neurological thing is concerned we go on to uh, ask atul a uh, headache is the important part and could be multifactorial in the, these patient have you come across patient with headache and what is your uh, approach to such patients uh, what do you do in such patient well, well sir if uh, talking of nervous system we've already heard of autonomic cns uh, headache yes sir that is quite and i think uh, headache along with insomnia is a common combination many people have Uh, anxiety and depression very similar to post traumatic stress disorder so they have uh, recurrent haunting thoughts of having gone through an illness or having a bereavement of a loss of a friend or relative or some financial issue so they have a, a situation very similar to post traumatic stress disorder with difficulty in sleep not catching enough sleep not getting enough rest overworking brain and headache Uh, even some uh, women young women with history of migraine uh, they also in- uh, notice increased frequency of migraine probably the cytokines have some effect on the nociceptive sensory signals so that is uh, very common and uh, 
as far as neurological concern uh, another cns problem which we have seen in hospitalized patients at fmri is uh, post covid stroke and although we we know that uh, covid is a pro inflammatory uh, pro thrombotic uh, systemic milieu but also the question of uh, hypoxic injury so it's multifactorial so cns uh, post traumatic stress disorder and headache and uh, stroke incidents because of inflammation uh, because of hypoxia and pro thrombotic milieu great uh, i think that is wonderful answer uh, typical of a seasoned uh, clinician uh, and uh, i have nothing much to add to your answer atul that's a wonderful we go on to the last question uh, before i i conclude uh, dr alka after uh, uh, one gets a covid infection people are asking uh, should i take vaccination at all number one or if i take vaccination should i take one dose or two dose or uh, when should we take the vaccination right so there is a lot of confusion about the vaccination especially in the post covid phase but after a long debate the ministry of health and family welfare they have come up with a clear recommendation that if you have had covid you should take a complete course of covid vaccinations after a gap of 3 months from the recovery of acute illness these and big that protective antibodies they don't remain uh, stay in the body for a longer time and the present data also show, shows that you know they last for up to 6 or 8 months so uh, the over a period of time this immunity wanes off or gradually decreases and uh, it becomes important to boost up this immunity and to make sure that you remain protected uh, and do not get covid in peri infections uh, if there is uh, any chances of that so it should be given after 3 months of the recovery from the acute infections now in case if you have uh, you know, acquired this covid infections after the first dose of vaccination in that scenario also it is recommended that the second dose should be completed after a gap of 3 months of your uh, recovery of the acute covid 19 infections thank you uh, uh, dr alka that's a very clear answer and that is the government of india advisory and uh, but uh, but the I, I must acknowledge at this point of time that research is uh, very little in this, and uh, uh, one doesn't know who will uh, actually benefit from a, a full course or who will not benefit, and who probably would have done without uh, vaccination. We have no way of knowing uh, except that further studies are needed. Uh, one question which uh, Ritesh has already answered about hair fall, which is very very commonly seen in uh, post COVID uh, syndrome. Uh, and he has answered that it is similar to hair fall in any acute illness. So typhoid illness, you know, the the, uh, the most common cause of a hair fall following illness, and uh, it is likely to occur in four to five months. There are a couple of other uh, reasons why a hair fall may occur, and those are deficiency of iron, deficiency hemoglobin goes down, and uh, deficiency of protein, and once the, all those are. Uh, supplemented patient is back on his legs and on uh, the correct nutrition and hair fall is likely to recover is not likely to be a, a permanent hair fall is not likely to be autoimmune type of hair fall so we are quite reassured by that particular answer now uh, last uh, uh, lastly uh, i would uh, show one slide uh, just one slide from our recent article uh, which uh, we have written and which is online now um, and there the summarizes uh, the diabetes covid-19 bidirectional relationship and also post covid syndrome so diabetes in covid-19 very severe uh, diabetes may occur prolonged hospitalization may occur assisted resp assisted respiration is common mark comorbidities nutrition is rapidly decreasing you will won't not believe within 3 days the uh, the protein from 4 goes to 2.8 and recovery is prolonged and so many of these factors may contribute to so called long covid but more appropriately called post covid syndrome and there also the worsening hyperglycemia because of multiple factors sarcopenia poor nutrition electrolyte disorders are very common <clears throat> worsening of comorbid diseases secondary infections psychological stress which we have not talked about in detail because of lack of time neuropathy and autonomic dysfunction and use of corticosteroid all this will contribute to post covid syndrome and corrective measures some of which we have already talked about 
we should ensure good glycemic and blood pressure control nutrition is foremost should be foremost in our mind and correction of nutritional deficiency psychological counseling psychologists and nutrition should be part of the team this is a multidisciplinary effort and a physical therapy specialist also if possible because physical rehabilitation with physiotherapy and exercise are as important as the psychological counseling or correction of nutritional deficiency prompt treatment of infection and surely early stoppage of corticosteroid you have to counsel patient that this is not going to last long and that maybe 3 months maybe 4 months but by 4 to 5 months you should be up and about back to pre covid state so with that i thank all my panelists for wonderful answers peace of their mind expert minds and their experience and um at at this point of time i finish this presentation and go uh, ask uh, dr ritesh to take on the next a uh, very very important symposium which is the heart failure symposium so thank you all yeah thank you uh, sir and uh, this brings us to the, the final part of today's uh, symposium and that is the heart failure symposium and before that uh, i want to announce that we had a quiz uh, uh, a few minutes back and and the winners of the quiz will be uh, contacted for award of cash prizes hmm? so congratulations to all the winners so uh, we have two uh, lectures uh, scheduled in heart failure symposium and the uh, and the first talk is by dr sanjay mittal who is director of clinical cardiology and research in vedanta hospital and uh, he'll be speaking on stable heart failure uh, and mortality benefit with therapy of uh, uh, of heart failure reduced ejection fraction so over to dr sanjay mittal thank you dr ritesh uh, i think i am audible and i'll just share my slides yes yes so this is a very important topic uh, heart failure and diabetes and heart failure are actually linked and uh, we understand we are graduating from the diabetic discussion to heart failure so the first thing i would like to mention here is that what is stable heart failure or is there anything which we call a stable heart failure commonly people who have less symptoms or rather uh, no symptoms they are perceived to have stable disease and they are be low risk and the physicians actually have inertia to optimize care because they think the person does not have symptoms and this is stable and there are concerns that uh, if i increase the medications there may be increase in uh, complications or uh, uh, side effects and that's why what's the need on the other hand people who are in yh class 3 or 4 they are supposed to be unstable and advanced stage of disease which actually is wrong because there are vice versa things from 2 can go to 3 invariably and 3 they can be stabilized with proper medications if we understand what happens to the heart failure this is exactly what happens you know their person is stable and there would be an acute decompensation and then the person does not actually come back to the normal there is some residual dysfunction which is increased and slowly slowly the heart function drops down and there is either sudden death or there is a progressive heart failure uh, increase and this is something which is a timed manner so as far as clinicians are seeing they are just seeing the tip of the iceberg that means the person's symptoms which can be controlled by diuretics or vasodilators but that does not mean you have controlled the heart failure process so what happens is just like an iceberg the major thing which is happening underground and that is because of the fact that there are compensatory mechanisms going on which is in the form of sympathetic stimulation and renal angiotensin activity which undergroundly is leading to furthering of structural damage and progression of disease which is silent and by the time we realize it's too late so in a way what happens is by the time person has no symptoms we think the person is stable but on the other hand there are underlying mechanisms which are so called neurohormonal activation a uh, compensatory mechanism leads to progression of increase in myocardial damage which can be judged by increase in troponin i and oxidative stress this can lead to sudden cardiac death in 45% patients and 55% patients would have progression of heart disease which is silent and it's too late as i said again nyh class 2 is not stable enough if you look at paradigm hf trial 
six out of that means almost 60 percent of all the deaths actually in paradigm hf trial happened in nyj class 2 category of patients not nyj class 3 or 4 they were uh, as you remember the and uh, the in paradigm hf trial the nyj class 2 was compounding to around uh, 75 percent of patients and 25 percent were nyj 3 or 4 but there the maximum deaths actually happened in nyj class 2. so it's not so innocuous but the second question is, can we somehow reduce the mortality in VIH class 2 patients with heparin? Well, there are two mechanisms. Either the person is asymptomatic, we keep on watching the patients, let the symptoms happen down, settle down, is there increase in breathing, uh, dysfunctional uh, fatigability and all. Well, these are important markers, but these should not be dictating terms in terms of improvement in medication, because this is what is of the late, the uh, criteria. All the trials which have been uh, there from the 2001 to 2014 and now even SGLT2 inhibitors which may be of importance to us heart failure cardiologists now. Every trial has shown that people whether they are in VHA class 2 or 3 they would show improvement in outcomes with either the beta blockers, ARD, ACE inhibitors or now the RNAs and other things. But unfortunately, we have to realize once a person has diagnosed a heart failure, despite the best use of ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, there's an unmet need. That means almost with best medical management still at the end of five years, 50% of the patients with heart failure diagnosis would not see the world. This is probably worse than many of the uh, malignancies. So... I'm going to discuss a little bit about the RNAs, which is combination of the con conventional ARBs. We know about the ARBs, which reduce the, uh, 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 blocks the angiotensin receptors and thus by reduce water retention and also vasodilator and reduces the direct effect of renin, renin uh, and renin angiotensin onto the myocardium and myocardial damage is reduced. On the other hand, by uh, inhibiting the nephrolysin, this leads to and natriuresis and thus by decreases the cardiac fibrosis and myocardial hypertrophy. Does a security valve improve in VIT class 2? That's the question. Stable heart failure. Well, if as I will go into the paradigm HF trial, I said that NYHA 1 and 2 were amounting for 75% of the population in both the NRPL as well as secretary of the group, and 25% had uh, NYHA 3 or 4. And if you look at uh, the outcomes, the outcomes were 20% reduction was seen in CV death on uh, primary heart failure hospitalization. And this is one of the reasons why the trial was prematurely stopped just in 27 months. 20% reduction in CV death, 16% reduction in all cause mortality was seen, and sudden cardiac death also was reduced by 20% uh, in RNA group as compared to the inalabral group. So this was importantly beneficial. Most importantly, if you look at NYG class 1 and 2, which was supposed to be innocuous or stable heart failure, the improvement was much more statistically, and this was p-value of interaction was significant. That means the significant, more significant improvement was seen in VIH class 1 and 2, which was amounting to around 25% risk reduction, 28% uh, risk reduction as compared to NYH class 3 or 4, which was just 10%. And why is it so? Probably because while wait for a person becoming symptomatic, the person is too far gone, the framework is distorted and this is too far to be repaired. And this is the important thing that if you look at CV death, again, the same way uh, with NYHA 1, 2 better, although the significance in the difference was not uh, much here. Uh, and on an average, if you look at people who were 55 years or uh, more, after 55 years, there was almost an addition of 1.5 years of life in this population. And similarly, even in elderly people, there was addition of 1.3 years, which was highly significant in this population who were NYH class 2 or more. Uh, last word about a word about Indian data that, okay, this was a uh, global data, but does Indian population behave the same way? Well, uh, out of the whole population of uh, 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 Paradigm HF, uh, NYHA 2 and 3, there was a, a good distribution of around 
340 patients who were from Indian origin in each arm. And uh, there was substantial distribution of NYHA class 2 here. And the results were parallel to what was seen globally. This is uh, Indian data here, small dot, small sample. And the large sample was the world over data and it behaved the same, line, same side of the midline. That means the RNAs were better in Indian population as much as it was seen in the Western population as compared to the combo of heart failure deaths and hospitalization or CV deaths or all cause death. Everything was towards the same side and in similar direction with P value of interaction not significant in any of them. So the last thing is what has resulted in it. This was important guideline change recently in 2021 that NYHA class two patients have a progressive disease who have uh, shown the worsening of heart failure if we are way too, too long. And hence novel therapies are needed to counteract the ongoing deterioration of heart failure. Don't be foxed by the symptomatic stability. This was what was the recommendation in 2016. It came out from ESC that only when the person remains symptomatic in heart failure, they reduce the infection to convert ACE inhibitors to RNAs. However, this thing has changed in 2021. Uh, the ACC consensus statement for the first time says that our knees are basically direct to our knee approach. That means we don't wait for the person to go on to ACE inhibitors, IRBs, deteriorate and then go to our knee, give them a few years so that the disease can be halted at the year, a lesser stage and the people can be benefited more. Uh, so to conclude, I leave you with the three point statement here that heart failure being a clinical progressive syndrome cannot be perceived as stable ever. NYHA class two heart failure with reduced ejection pressure patients are still at a high risk of mortality. Initiation of sacubitral valsartan is a guideline directed therapy in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, And this is directed to reduce CV death and heart failure hospitalization as well as in inpatient heart failure reduced ejection fraction, reduce risk of sudden cardiac death and prolonged survival in heart failure with reduced uh, ejection fraction patients. Thank you for your uh, punches. Thank you, Dr. Mittal. And that was uh, very well presented. And I think that everyone has got the take home message that, uh, that uh, you need not wait for the patient to deteriorate and, and uh, direct to our knee or, or early RNA use in patients with stable heart failure is what is going to prevent uh, um, the, the worsening and, and prolong the survival. So thank you, Dr. Mittal. We'll, we'll wait for any questions in the chat box. Thank you. Uh, and we move on to the next uh, talk, which is on management of heart failure with reduced ejection fraction in patients with chronic kidney disease. And it's my pleasure to invite Dr. Dinesh Kulla, who has been associated with Ahuja Bajaj Symposium, various previous editions of Ahuja Bajaj Symposium. It's again a pleasure to welcome him again. And Dr. Kulla is the Chairman, Nephrology and Renal Transplant Medicine at Tech Super Specialty Hospital. So over to Dr. Kulla. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Zesh, and thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Amisha and everyone in the organizing uh, committee for this wonderful opportunity one more time. Uh, are my slides visible, uh, Dr. Sage? They, 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 we can see your slides, yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. So uh, as the topic has already been introduced, I'm going to talk on uh, about the management of heart failure uh, in patients with reduced uh, ejection fraction and those who already have chronic kidney disease. So let's first recapitulate our knowledge about the way we describe cardiorenal syndrome these days. We know there are five types, the type one and type two, when the heart leads us towards the kidney problem and type three and four, where predominantly it's been the kidney disease, which uh, then cause, uh, causes uh, uh, heart failure, heart involvement. If it is uh, uh, acute to acute, it's type three. If a chronic kidney disease causes uh, a chronic heart failure, it's type four. And we all know that type five, when there is a, a mixed etiology, or where there is a secondary cause of uh, a cardiorenal syndrome. But what is important to note is that, that both renal impairment and heart failure go hand in hand. One leads to the other and vice versa. If we look at heart failure 
typically in a patient with chronic kidney disease, there are almost to the tune of 40% chances that your patient will have congestive cardiac failure, especially if he or she has advanced chronic kidney disease. One third of acute decompensated heart failure patients <clears throat> always have a history of uh, some kind of renal dysfunction. And important to note that 65% uh, increased risk uh, is there uh, of heart failure rehospitalization due to worsening renal failure in these patients. Important to note also that if we look at the spectrum, the coronary heart disease, the cerebral vascular accident, and congestive heart failure, the heart failure tops it all uh, when you look at the various uh, stages of CKD and CHF is the most common cause of cardiovascular mortality across all stages of uh, chronic kidney disease. Well, um, as I said, when the, the chronic kidney disease causes some challenge to the heart function, we typically uh, label it as, for our matter of understanding, as type 4 cardiorenal syndrome. And I will try to limit myself uh, to mainly this area. And first, let's try and see as to how does chronic kidney disease affect the heart. Of course, when you look at the early stages of chronic kidney disease, uh, stage one and two, the, the common factors such as the, the genetically uh, mediated factors, the presence or absence of diabetes and hypertension are the, are the main offenders. While as the chronic kidney disease stage progresses, especially stage three, four, and, and uh, finally stage five, you can see the additional components of chronic kidney disease, that's the anemia, the uremic toxins, and the chronic inflammatory state, as well as the erythropoietin resistance, they all finally uh, play a role and cause chronic heart dysfunction. And, and uh, this is something which has been translated into the, the real world evidence where you find that seven out of 10 patients of chronic kidney disease have congestive cardiac failure by the time they reach a stage of dialysis. The incidence of heart failure was found to be threefold higher in individuals whose GFR was less than 60. That is typically stage three of chronic kidney disease. Well, if, if you want to know as to what are typically the factors which, which go into this causation, of course, there are the traditional risk factors such as diabetes, hypertension, and the obesity, and, and the uh, pre-existence of uh, coronary artery disease and LVH, while the novel risk factors which get added because of the chronic uh, kidney disease are the, the uh, very common, uh, common occurrence of volume overload, anemia, chronic inflammation, and the oxidative stress. So one thing is very clear, both, as I said earlier, go hand in hand, but the big problem is the challenge in the diagnosis because there are similar signs and symptoms in, in patients with chronic kidney disease. And so it's very difficult to distinguish heart failure from an ordinary uh, systemic volume overload, which you always are going to anticipate in a patient with advanced chronic kidney disease. And early symptoms so many times are missed. The, the typical uh, things which help you like an echocardiogram, the ECG, the chest x-rays, the, the um, biomarkers like, such as the NT-proBNP, they do not really help much in a patient with coexisting chronic kidney disease. So your diagnosis so many times gets missed and you have to have a high index of suspicion. And, and uh, um, we have uh, just now learned that um, there is nothing called a stable heart failure. And if you have missed the bus earlier on, you are going to pay the price later on. Well, moving on to the treatment, we know that time-tested weapons in our armamentarium have been beta blockers and gas uh, inhibitors. But unfortunately, by the time uh, a CKD patient uh, with more advanced stage of CKD lands up on dialysis, only about 25% of patients are found to be on either beta blocker or RAS blocker, while 75% are not, even though we may strongly believe that these are the drugs which should be an integral part of management of heart failure. So moving on and to check individually each and uh, 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 one of these uh, class of drugs, RAS blockers have been a, a great boon to the management of both heart failure as well as chronic kidney disease individually. And we, we have learned a lot about these in the last 30 years. But in spite of huge data in some landmark trials, 
we still believe that that there, uh, there we still need something more over and above dos blockers this is what we have felt all these years even though they had shown a definite evidence but there have been some uh, uh, problems associated with the long term management in patients uh, with chronic kidney disease be it the 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 worsening of chronic kidney disease the be it the worsening of hyperkalemia and so many times one one has to have the confidence that the initial decline that's a physiological decline uh, in the gfr uh, with the introduction of ras blockers uh, one should have the the conviction regarding the the prolonged usage of ras blockers and not be uh, disenchanted by the initial decline in the gfr so what i mean is you have to have confidence in ras blockade but unfortunately we still believed all these years especially in terms of uh, the heart failure that we needed something over and above ras blockers and that's typically where uh, we believe and as dr mittal has shown the great potential and evidence which has come up with the usage of uh, arni whereby as we all know on one hand we are suppressing the nephrolysin activity and causing vasodilatation on the other hand we are suppressing the ras activation and thereby relieving the uh, vasoconstriction well paradigm a heart failure trial we all know had 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 uh, shown us uh, great results with the introduction of uh, arni but has has it really impacted the patients with chronic kidney disease let's try and see and if now we can believe that arni could have a role to play in patients with chronic kidney disease well the answer is yes because as you can see compared with enlalapril there was a 21% uh, uh, reduction in the cardiovascular outcomes in patients with hfref irrespective of uh, uh, chronic kidney disease status on the left are the patient with uh, stage 3 of ckd on the right with with some uh, with when the gfr was more than 60 and everyone uh, stood to benefit with the introduction of arni and the same holds true when you look at the all cause mortality as you can see compared with enlalapril 21% reduction in all cause mortality with the introduction of uh, arni in patients with established chronic kidney disease well uh, if you if you look at uh, what it does to the risk of end stage renal disease again uh, patients who were put on uh, arni uh, stood to gain uh, as compared to um, uh, an ace inhibitors that's uh, uh, in alapril 30% reduction in the risk of end stage kidney disease so this is what you are wanting to see because the occurrence of heart failure uh, has been found to to um, uh, impact the progression of uh, um, chronic kidney disease so anything which is effectively relieving the uh, heart failure uh, uh, in a patient of uh, uh, in a patient of chronic kidney disease will also help in slowing down the rate of progression of chronic kidney disease in these patients well um the same thing the in the real world it was in shown that the incidence of worsening renal function um uh, well not 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 in the real world in the hospitalized patients when compared to ace inhibitor arni had a, a role to play here as well in comparison with uh, enlalapril well the uh, it has also been shown that uh, that it reduces cardiovascular death or unplanned uh, heart failure hospitalization in not just chronic kidney disease stage 1 where as you can see there was 14% reduction in cardiovascular death or uh, hospitalization due to heart failure but even in the more advanced stages that is stage 4 or 5 as you can see here the results were even more profound 28% uh, risk reduction in the cardiovascular death or hospitalization due to heart failure so you can see arni um, had been shown to be beneficial across all stages of uh, chronic kidney disease and it has also been as i said earlier shown to improve the egfr in patients with hfref because we know that heart failure has an uh, has a direct impact on the on the renal function so anything which ameliorates heart failure symptoms is indirectly going to cause an improvement in the heart function well the fear always with the ace inhibitors and for that matter valsartan in arni is the risk of hyperkalemia and we have to be of course mindful of this but then luckily uh, the risk is not too much as was shown in in paradigm paradigm heart failure as well in subsequent trials 
the risk of uh, causation of hyperkalemia with arni is is lesser as compared to um enalapril at least uh, the the more severe varieties of hyperkalemia that is potassium more than 6 was found in a significantly lesser population of patients uh, if they were on arni as compared to uh, enalapril but then as of course you always have to be careful about hyperkalemia and and these are the uh, uh, dosage guidelines Uh, whereby if your patient has a ckd stage 1 2 3 or 4 you don't have to make any uh, dose adjustments with arni but if your patient has more advanced uh, renal failure that is uh, ckd stage 4 onwards uh, the starting dose can be 50 mg and then you can take 2 to 3 3 4 weeks to uh, up titrate the dose to reach the maximum of 100 mg this is this is the uh, the general recommendation but then on a case by case basis you can always think of increasing the dose if you believe your patient is going to benefit but again keeping a close watch on the potassium uh, as well as the gfr of the patient so moving on so we we have so far seen that arni is is a relatively newer weapon and the way it has excited all the cardiologists colleagues it has done the same to our uh, nephrology fraternity as well whereby we have woken up to a great uh, weapon in our armamentarium to help our patients uh, of ckd with associated heart failure well beta blockers have been the time tested uh, weapon uh, in the management of heart failure and the interesting thing is that there is a sympathetic overactivity uh, always there in in patients with chronic kidney disease so we would have thought that most of our patients uh, in and uh, with chronic kidney disease should be on a beta blocker but unfortunately as i had shown earlier by the time they reach uh, uh, the stage of dialysis very few are actually on beta blockers i wish uh, we we had the 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 courage to to put more and more uh, such patients we have to learn from our cardiology colleagues how to best use uh, uh, beta blockers in the setting of uh, um, um, advanced uh, uh, heart failure uh, situations but then i think i would certainly advocate the use of uh, uh, um, beta blockers in chronic kidney disease in the management especially of uh, uh, heart failure because of the associated uh, heightened sympathetic activity well another important and a very uh, interesting aspect is of the use of mras when the cardiologists or other people managing the heart failure they will not feel the challenge while advocating the use of mras but we as nephrologists when the gfr is already been impaired we are always scared of using drugs like uh, spironolactone or planinone because of the risk of uh, hyperkalemia now this is what the the korean registry showed that with the use of uh, uh, spironolactone early on stage 3b they could they could demonstrate great effects Uh, in 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 the survival rate um not so much in more advanced stages of ckd but what is interesting is to note that with after the rails the data was published there was lot of optimism and more and more people as you can see on the right hand side started advocating the use of uh, spironolactone as you can see here but at the same time there were more and more uh, hospitalizations because of hyperkalemia so you cannot go away from the fact that while you are wanting to prescribe uh, mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist you you will of course have to be very mindful of the risk of uh, hyperkalemia and that is why we are so optimistic about the new uh, uh, weapon in this class and that's uh, nerinon and the fidelio ckd trial has shown uh, uh, dkd trial has shown that the risk of hyperkalemia may actually be quite low in people who are Uh, put on finarinon and i think uh, uh, the trial is going to be underway in our country as well and we are also excited about the availability of direct aldosterone antagonist so i think uh, we are going to have more and more weapons uh, available to us in the management of heart failure in patients with ckd as i said uh, we have to be mindful of the risk of hyperkalemia diuretics have always been there to to take care of the heart failure symptoms the relief to the symptoms they may not have a, a long term mortality benefit but of course they are great drugs to uh, take care of the symptoms of the patients once they present to us uh, with advanced uh, uh, stages of heart failure the the dosage whether it is going to be a low dose or high dose is a matter of debate and 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 it's still a matter of debate as said uh, even after the dose ahf and other such related trials well the important thing is 
if your diuretics fail, you at times have to resort to extracorporeal therapy. And we as, as nephrologists would be quite keen on, on taking care of the symptoms of uh, congestive cardiac, cardiac failure in a patient who has stopped responding to diuretics, has diuretic resistance. And there again, there have been many trials which have shown us that, that they may be a great uh, thing to do, but beware that the, uh, of the fact that rapid weight loss uh, can actually give rise to higher incidence of uh, um, um, renal dysfunction. So you have to weigh out the balance. Well, before I, I end, uh, everyone here is, is quite excited about what SGLT2 inhibitors have shown us. And same is true with us nephrologists. And, and uh, more and more data, starting with the uh, AMPA reg and then with Predence and the declared TME and uh, DAPA CKD more recently had shown that even patients with more advanced uh, uh, stages of chronic kidney disease stood to gain from the introduction of uh, SGLT2 inhibitors. And, and the most recent one has been DAPA CKD, where uh, GFR as low as 30 ml. Uh, was taken as a recruitment uh, uh, strategy. Uh, we are going to have AMPA kidney results available next year, whereby we will be looking at uh, um, uh, GFR as low as 20. I stand corrected, DAPA CKD was as low as 25, while Credence was as low as 30. So we have been trying to lower the bar, and yet we are seeing that the risk of, as, as you can see here, uh, is that uh, even the, the heart failure, uh, hospitalization, cardiovascular deaths, everything um, uh, was found to uh, experience uh, gains by the introduction of uh, SGLT2 inhibitors. As you can see here in the most recent uh, DAPA CKD results were announced on, uh, last August, you can see the, the hazard ratio for the cardiovascular death or hospitalization due to heart failure was 0 0.71. That's almost like 30% risk reduction. And all cause mortality also showed 30% roughly uh, risk reduction. Uh, in these patients who have already had advanced CKD. The same similar kind of results have been shown uh, in the DAPA heart failure trial, emperor uh, um, uh, reduced trial, where also there was a sizable uh, population with uh, similar uh, uh, demographics. So if we look at the, what uh, really helps our patients with more advanced uh, chronic kidney disease, now that is where we are lacking. And that's something to be really scared about. As you can see on the left-hand side with CKD stage one and two, you have many um, uh, strong uh, things available to you, which have a strong evidence in the management of uh, heart failure. But as you move from uh, stage one to more advanced uh, stages of chronic kidney disease, there are not too many uh, uh, weapons left by the time we reach stage four and five, as you can see here, it's only beta blockers, which have been shown to be efficacious and, and the level of evidence is moderate at best uh, in patients who have more advanced uh, uh, chronic kidney disease. But short of these more advanced stages, uh, all these patients, you have uh, uh, many, many uh, things available to us, which can actually make a huge difference in the management of heart failure in our patients with chronic kidney disease. So to conclude my talk, uh, ladies and gentlemen, type four, and I had specifically limited myself to type four uh, cardiorenal syndrome, whereby the kidney was, was uh, uh, having an adverse effect on the heart function. It is associated with particularly high morbidity and mortality. One third of patients with acute decompensated heart failure have a history of uh, renal dysfunction. Patients with uh, more advanced stages of chronic kidney disease have a very high prevalence of uh, heart failure. We have typically drugs like uh, RAS blockers, and now uh, more and more data with ARNI, which has been become, which has now become the the most uh, preferred tool in the management of heart failure in these patients, uh, alongside beta blockers. And whenever we can use the uh, MRAs, we can give them a chance. And of course, we are eagerly awaiting the availability of those who have um, lesser chances of causing uh, hyperkalemia. And then, of course, uh, we, are, we are quite excited with what SGLT2 inhibitors have shown up in the recent years. But so far, something which has really changed the, the way we look at heart failure management in our patients with CKD, that's ARNI. And I, I think... Uh, uh, with a little bit of caution as far as the, the uh, 
monitoring of the patient's GFR and, and potassium levels is concerned, we can be bold enough to continue uh, advocating the use of ARNI uh, in our patients with CKD across all stages of uh, uh, CKD. No agent, unfortunately, has been shown to have a strong level of evidence of efficacy in patients with stage four or five of CKD. We will still be on the lookout for some great uh, uh, thing here. Diuretics and vasodilators have more of a, a palliative or symptomatic uh, relief uh, um, a giving role, especially in patients with acute decompensated heart failure. And devices, I think, are left best to the cardiologists and let Dr. Uh, Mithil uh, enlighten us about that aspect. And there is, of course, as I said earlier as well, there's a need for a new therapy to focus on something called labeled as cardiorenal syndrome and to treat the patient as a whole patient and not piecemeal uh, labeling them as a renal patient or a heart patient or vice versa. So with that, I conclude and I'll be happy to answer any questions and uh, queries. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Uh, that was very comprehensively covered. Uh, many take home messages, but I think uh, the most important for me was to identify the, to acknowledge the existence of a cardiorenal syndrome, to, to, to look at heart and kidney as one, and, and to uh, identify challenges in heart failure diagnosis in patients with chronic kidney disease. I think there, it is with there the clinical uh, uh, acumen comes in because uh, your, your uh, ECG, your ECO, your your uh, markers don't help you that much in, in that regard. And then, of course, uh, uh, the, the need to increase the usage of uh, heart failure therapies like uh, RAS blockers and ARNI and, and beta blockers. I think that has well been has been highlighted very well by you. So if there are any questions, we'll be, we'll be happy to take them. Uh, we'll just uh, see the chat box if there are any questions. Uh, Right now there are none, but uh, but if there are any questions, I think they'll be will be forwarding them to you. So thank you, uh, Dr. Kullar, and thank you, Dr. Mittal, for this uh, these excellent talks in the heart failure uh, uh, symposium. And now now I hand over to Dr. Amrita Ghosh for for a vote of thanks. Thank you, Dr. Ritesh. Uh, thank you, Dr. Nur Mishra, for the wonderful thank opportunity you. once again. Thanks. Thank you, wonderful lecture, both of you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nur Mishra. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. So this brings us to the end of seventh edition of uh, Ahuja Bajaj Symposium. And I thank my sponsor, Novartis, and Nobilis Mankind for their effort. And I thank team Ahuja Bajaj, uh, uh, especially Mr. Huck and his team, Koel and Kanika, and their effort, the Prakash, for his effort. Thank you so much. And I thank Dr. Ritesh, Dr. Atul, Dr. Alka, Dr. Sweety, Dr. Seema, everyone for their effort. And above all, I thank Dr. Anup Mishra for his constant mentorship. And uh, thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Uh, have a great Sunday. Thank you. Uh, I would want to just say before logging out, there's a small, uh, the prizes will be given, the, the prizes which are there will be sent to you to mail. Please send your email ID to coildattac at the rate of gmail.com. And if you want, if you wish to get the second edition book of Dr. Anup Mishra called Diabetes with Delight, again, email at the same email ID, coildattac at the rate of gmail.com. And for the certificate, there's a small link down, uh, given at the bottom. Please uh, download your certificate for the session. Thank you so much and have a great Sunday. We're logging out. Thank you. Thank you.